Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. I'm David Farkas. I'm joined, as always, by Josh Lair. Hey, everybody. And we've got Jose Rivera producing the show as Hello. a regular. How you guys doing? Kirsten uh, will not be joining us because she is having a great time leading one of our uh, landscape destination workshops in Iceland along with Colin. And uh, I assume they're having a great time because I haven't heard anything <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. So uh, looking forward to seeing all the shots there. And to uh, any of our viewers who are in Iceland right now, well, you're probably watching this after you got back and you had a great time. So congratulations. Um, so today we are kind of taking a deep dive, a little bit more technically oriented than uh, our last couple episodes with our kind of a lot of fun, right? Looking at kits and yeah. What, what are we um, doing, Josh? Well, a request that, well, we get a lot of requests very often, but we a request we get a lot is quite our questions about the settings we use, the custom functions we use, how we shoot with our cameras and how we set up our menus. Mm -hmm. And we never really could deep dive into that because we didn't have the proper overhead camera set up to do it. Thanks to David, now we do. So yeah. we are testing our dual overhead camera setup today for the first time. Well, we tested it already, but we're using it for the first time. If yeah. anything comes crashing down on us, well, you know, whatever. Uh, we probably deserved it. But, but uh, <laughs> so anyway, so now that we have our cool overhead setup, uh -huh. we can show you our screens and we can go through the settings. Um, what are we going to be trying to cover today? Ooh, I think a lot because if, and this is something that we talked about before, right? So are we going to go through and cover every single menu option? Are we just going to cover the things that are the really most important things to change that are going to make the biggest difference in day to day? You know, uh, should we talk about user profiles? Are we going to talk about setting custom functions? There's there's quite a lot on. Uh, we're going to start, by the way, with the SL2 that Josh has here and the SL2S that I have here, which are really similar except for a few yeah, from a menu standpoint there. Yeah, there's like a few yeah. items in the SL2S that don't exist in the SL2 but really mostly for video. Um which we're not getting into. Today. No, we're not getting into. <laughs> Today, not, not the not the video. So there's yet. so much to cover. Um I think we're going as we talked about, we're going to start with what you need to know kind of top line and we're going to go from there. And if we have time to get in a little bit more nitty gritty and a little more granular, I think we will. But we're going to start a little bit more high level in terms of talking about the settings that as soon as I pick up a camera or Josh picks up a camera, like right away, we're not going to use that camera until we change the settings. Correct. Our goal is to have a practical approach to the menu. So this is not going to be a two hour us reading the instruction manual, right? right. This is not, we're not going to cover every setting, every scenario. And everything ever, what we're going to talk about is some of the things uh, that we've learned from using the SL system since it first came out. Yeah. Um, that we've learned ourselves, we've learned from from you guys, and we've learned from trial and error. And just to, we're going to, I think our plan is we're going to reset these cameras. At least that was my plan on this well, one. It's bold. Um, it's bold. It's bold. So that we're <laughs> starting from the way it comes out of the box. Okay. And then we'll go through the menu, starting at the top, and kind of go through, again, some of those key things that we like to change. And the thing is, we might agree. We might disagree. Yeah. Uh, that's why we have two cameras. Exactly. Right. So, right. So we we have a lot of things that we do similarly, but also a lot of things that we do differently. I don't know why you didn't put an autofocus lens on there, by the way, since we're going to be covering focusing. Oh. <laughs> While well, he changes the, the, the <laughs> lens, um, put on... Um, you got a 75? Yeah. This is a, yeah, put on this one. There we go. We have a variety of things. Although we do want to show... We will, yeah, but we should start, they, yeah. we should start uh, with... Because we're also... We'll talk about how certain things are going to be a little bit different with a adapted manual focus lens versus a native L mount autofocus lens. So we'll, we will definitely get into that. So our goal is SL2, SL2S. Um, we did say initially in our description we were going to get into the Q2. I have a feeling that we're going to spend two hours on the SL2 and the SL2S, yeah. which is fine with us. We, we're, we may. We're going to see not. how it goes. We're yeah. not going to rush, but we're also not going to drag on for no reason. Right. That That's the thing, is we don't want to gloss over things that, that are important and are useful because there's always future episodes, right? right. So, right. 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 so right. if we right. find that, that there's a lot of value and you guys are actually getting good information and practical, usable information that you can take to your own photography, 
we're just going to stick with it. Yeah. We're just telling you up front. Yeah. Like, if you're all the Q people waiting, it's like, when are they going to do Q? <laughs> After we finish this. Right. We're not going to try to rush and to cover the entire Q in the last six minutes of the no. show. Um, so, um, you know, what we'll, what we'll do is as we talk about stuff, um, whoever's looking at the chat, whether it's Jose or David or mm -hmm. myself, will make sure that we address relevant questions timely. So if we're covering a setting and we see a question about that setting, we'll try to get to make sure we answer it For while sure. we're there. We don't want to necessarily have a too scatterbrained, non-linear where we're like constantly going back right. and forth because we do want to kind of follow the flow of the menu layout mm -hmm. um, a little bit. Okay, before we dive into that, I mentioned that our colleagues Kirsten mm -hmm. and Colin are in Iceland, mm -hmm. but we do have an announcement related to workshops. Yes. Obviously, you can't join them in Iceland because they're already there. I mean, I guess, I guess you, you could. You could, <laughs> you theoretically. Play, but not play right now, but wait till the show's over. Wait till the show's over. Yeah. Uh, but we do actually have a one spot remaining for our Moab uh, Astro Night Landscape Photography kind of deal that's coming up next month, or this coming month in September. And we have one spot remaining. So if you are interested in that, uh, you yeah, want to- Yeah, we get questions all the time about astrophotography. So if you, if you want the chance to actually be out in the field with, who's going on that one? Colin. Col is it Colin? Peter. Colin and Peter. Peter. Learning about astrophotography with fellow interested astrophotographers, this is the place and time to do it. When is it exactly? It's right here. September 18th. Jose, can you pull up the old computer screen? Here we go. So as you can see, we've got Moab Astrophotography Workshop, September 18th through the 23rd, and we only have one spot left. So uh, yeah, actually Colin took that with the, oh, that's a cropped photo. Yeah, so he took these photos with, uh, with his SL. So I think you uh, definitely want to, to join in and see how you can do cool yeah, astrophotography like this and uh, shooting the Milky Way. And how do they find this if they're on our website, David? So to find this, you go to LikeAstorMiami.com, which is going to be here. And then you go to Workshops and Events, Destination Workshops. And you'll see right here, Moab. One spot left. One spot left. All right. Who's going to be that last lucky participant? I don't know. We'll find out. Hopefully someone good. Um, <laughs> I, so anyway, I had to, we had to mention that. And, and I also want to show something else on the website while we're on it. Okay. Just, it's a little cool project, side project I've been involved in, and it's something that, that we've been talking about for ever, which hopefully it's a little bit under the radar because we haven't made an announcement uh, in email form, but I'm going to share with you guys here. It's not 100% done yet. We're still uh, fleshing it out, but I do want to show you. So, Jose, come back here one one sec so i'm going to go back to the main page and under camera systems here all the way at the bottom we have something called past product archive and if you click for instance m camera archive this is uh, a listing of all of the special editions that have you'll see if it says edition sold out like this that means it was a special edition and it's it's no longer available and also just regular discontinued cameras like here, the MD-262. And what's kind of uh, cool about this is these are the listings that we had originally when this camera was new. So you can read about, about it. You can see all the tech specs. And in, in some cameras, for instance, I'll give you an example of one that this is the part that we're still working on. So you'll actually see uh, that it, we identify if it's a special edition or a regular production run, how many were made, when it was introduced, and links to Reddit form content for any of those cameras. So eventually, it's a lot of products, but eventually we'll, we'll have this information for all the products. So you have an excellent resource uh, if you're looking to purchase a used one, or you're looking to find out informa more information about a camera you already have, or looking to buy, whatever. Uh, this is going to be a really handy guide, and we have cameras, M cameras, M lenses, SL cameras, Q cameras, CL cameras, all that, uh, Xs. So uh, check it out at your leisure. And if you have any uh, suggestions or feedback, send them our way. We're, uh, we're happy to take those into consideration. Sweet. And we should start the show. Let's start the show. <laughs> let's do this. All right. So let's, uh, while we want to do me just kind of showing the reset process here a little bit on mine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 
So Jose, come to my camera here. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I have an SL2, is I'm going to reset it so that we are starting from scratch. So we go menu, we're gonna go up, take it to the bottom, reset camera, we're gonna say yes. I'm gonna say yes to all of the prompts. So I super, when it says restart, that basically just means power cycle. Yeah, that was page six on the... Page six, the last page, yeah. at the very bottom. Then we get this cool animation. I do love the animation. It's very exciting. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> like children, like, ooh, shiny. All right, we are going to pick English. I'm going to skip the setup for now. I'm going to skip the time and date and just have well, to. Well, hold on. Are you using just, just explain. You're skipping the photo setup, which links to the phone. Correct. And I skipped the time and date setup because that's not relevant for right now. Okay. Um, so now we're looking at the SL2, the way it comes out of the box. And the first thing that we should sort of explain essentially is how we're going to get to the menu to start talking about these settings. And that's going to be kind of obvious, but I'll explain anyway. I'm going to reset mine too so yeah. that when we bounce back and forth, perfect. we're going to keep our cameras a little bit in sync. Uh, the first time we hit the menu button, we're taken to this sort of a quick menu screen. This is a relatively new feature that Leica is now incorporating on all of their models. And this is going to give you some basic status information about the camera as well as access to a certain number of settings. Unfortunately, this is not customizable. I hope eventually that happens, but as of now, um, this is what you get. So that's what you see the first time you hit the menu button. Once you hit it again, now we're into the main menu, which you can see because it says main menu on the top left there. And there are six pages, but you can see here, um, a couple of basic navigational concepts before we talk about settings. If I hit the menu button again, it's gonna page down through the six menu pages plus the quick menu. So you can see as I just hit menu, it's gonna cycle through those. So if you know for sure, like let's say something's on the fourth page of the menu, you could just tap on menu a couple times, get to page four. Um, you can also navigate three other ways, crazily enough. One would be the dial on the top of the camera. One would be the dial on the back of the camera. And the third would be oops, the joystick on the back. So you have three different ways, depending on your mood, I guess, to uh, navigate the menu system. As they uh, say, choose your own adventure. Exactly. So uh, anyway, so that's you'll see me do a combination, well, both of us yeah. will do various things, depending on what we're trying to get to, we'll use. Now, yeah. now interestingly, yes. the, the one way that you can't, that you can't navigate is you can't use the touchscreen. Correct. And in, in the in the listed menus. So yeah. Yeah. In I don't the know listed if menus. If add that later, I feel like it would be kind of hard. It would be. Yeah. It's not really like if you look at the like a T system, mm -hmm. the menu is like big chunky icons that were very touch friendly because that was a touch friendly or a touch screen camera only. I don't know. I think there's too many settings in here. Um, and interestingly, that main touch menu could be reorganized. So it would be interesting to take the quick menu. That's what I, you know, that's the precedent that I use. Like you could organize the menu on the TL2. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping we get that quick menu organization at some point. I don't know if it's like they don't have the rendering ability for those icons or I don't know what, but something. We told them that we want it. So <laughs> anyway, so the first thing, and we're going to kind of go top down here in the menu is drive mode. Uh, David and I use drive mode probably very differently just because we do different kinds of photography most of the time. I'll kick it over to you for now. Okay, sure. Since I've been doing most of the talking. <laughs> and, uh, okay, okay. Why don't you give us a quick rundown of sort of the key things to know in drive mode and I'll hop in as sure. I need to. So as you can see, let's scoot that up. Uh, as you can see on my camera here, I've look, we've got, it's pretty self-explanatory. Single and you have various uh, continuous speeds along with self-timer, two and self-12 seconds, interval shooting, multi-exposure uh, bracketing, and multi-shot. Now, almost all the time when I'm out just regular shooting, I'm going to be using single because I even if I'm shooting fast, the camera's so responsive that the shutter's so responsive that if I push it very quickly, I'm basically getting kind of continuous shooting, but at my pace. Uh, if I'm on a tripod, I'm generally using two-second self-timer, and sometimes I'm doing exposure bracketing if I'm trying to do an HDR for landscape photography. And likewise, sometimes I'm using multi-shot. I think this is a little bit confusing that multi-shot is actually in drive mode. Mm. I think it should be its own menu item. It, it, I don't believe that it should be here. Well, uh, the re I think the reason it's there is because they added that feature in firmware. Yeah. And they had to put it somewhere. It wasn't like something, even though they, they talked about they were going to do it, 
Um, it didn't really have a better home. And that's also something I should mention at, at this point is we have, of course, current firmware on our cameras, uh, 3.1 for the SL2S and 4.1 for the SL2. If you have one of these cameras and you want to play along at home, if you will, you'll want to make sure your firmware is updated. That's really, really important because they've added some small changes and some big changes to the camera menu system uh, via the last several firmware updates. So if you're not up to date, you may not see exactly the same thing we're seeing and you're going to be missing out on features. I know I lecture you people about this all the time, update your firmware, but please update your firmware. If you don't know how to do it, when the show is over, we have an entire two-parter yes. dedicated just to how to update your firmware, depending on the camera you have. So, And I would add, yes, what would if, you add? Jose, if you look at the screen to my side here, that side, look at the uh, computer screen, you can see, for instance, what we're dealing with is as you can see, major firmware updates for SL2, SL2S. Oh, this isn't the current one. Um, for this is not the latest <laughs> one, one that, that. but that was just a bug fix. Yeah. This is the one where they introduced a lot of the features that we're, we're talking about here. So check this out if you haven't seen it already. This is on Red Dot Forum. Just search for firmware. And like Josh said, check out the firmware episode where we go over two all episodes. of Two episodes where we went yeah. over all this. Yeah, and we, if you're not like clear, those episodes, we went from totally from scratch. So we show how to prepare the camera, prepare the memory card, prepare the computer, everything from zero is explained in that episode, how to do firmware. So if you're, you're new to that concept, don't worry, we cover it from scratch. So, all right, um, I want to talk about, well, let's drive. Well, I'm going to get into some of the things that are, I think, relevant. Yeah, I'm going to talk um, about at least single. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Go to David. There we go. <laughs> okay. So single self-explanatory, right? But I'm just going to talk briefly about exposure bracketing and the settings that I use for landscape photography, because mm -hmm. I think that is relevant. Yeah. And to get into this, you can use, I use the joystick and you can either push it or if you go forward and back, whoop, if you go forward and back, it'll toggle you between this menu and the sub menu. Okay. And then I use the joystick to navigate around within that menu. So generally what I do is I use three frames, but I don't use the default of one EV. That means it's one stop between the exposure bracketed frames. I set this to two EV. How did you get it to be activated? Did you tap the joystick? Yep, I just push the joystick in. Okay. It activates it, and then I'm using the side to side motion to adjust that. And there's a little visual aid here at the bottom. You Is can that touch sensitive? Do we know? No. Oh, sad. No. Some of the menus are. So Some of the menus are. This one is not. Uh, and then if you have an exposure compensation offset, you would put it here, and it kind of shifts the whole scale, which is which is pretty cool. I like that visual. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's a really neat visual. And and sometimes I will purposely underexpose, even though I'm bracketing. So I don't usually touch it here. I'm usually using exposure compensation on the camera itself, and mm -hmm. that will relate to this menu without me having to adjust this menu. Yeah. But I just leave these settings alone. I'm always shooting at three three frames, two stops apart, and what that's doing is basically expanding your dynamic range by four stops. Because in addition to the regular exposure, you have now spanned four additional stops. So you're getting about, what do you say, about 18, 18 19 stops of dynamic range on the SL3. Well, once you put them all together. Once you, yeah. once you yeah. put them together. <laughs> exactly. make that, we exactly. make that clear. Okay. And I think it's, it's, I see people doing one stop or sometimes less than one stop. The reality is, the camera's got enough dynamic range to do a one-stop bracket from a single DNG file where For you sure. can just process it out. So doing one-stop is just, just not enough. Yeah. No. Okay. Carry on. Back to drive mode. There you go. Back to drive mode. So I'm going to leave that as is. Um, I also, talking about drive mode, because I am often bouncing around between single shot and two-second self-timer and exposure bracketing, I will assign that as a custom function, which mm. the way we do that. Yeah, I think what I like the strategy, by the way, to interrupt. I think what we'll do is as we go through a setting that one of us uses on a custom sure. function, we'll say that. Okay. So keep an eye out. We're going to kind of throw that in as we go. Like we'll say what we use for custom functions. Okay. So this custom function button right here, there is two on the top of the camera, there is one back here. This technically is a custom function button, although I use it for EVF control. And then there's two on the front of the camera. If I push and hold, 
Well, first, if I just tap it single, you'll see that what I did is now I went from photo mode into video mode. I don't really have a use for that for landscape photography. So what I'm going to do is push and hold. And right now, the default behavior as it comes out of the box is photo video toggle. And I'm going to scroll down right here, again, using my joystick. That's my preferred navigation method, although you can use the wheel. I will go to drive mode and select drive mode. Now, when I push this button right here, I can easily jump between a two-second self-timer, single, or exposure bracketing. Mm. Super, super easy and really, really fast. That way, I'm able to work off a tripod when I want to and then put it on self-timer uh, and I'm back there. So, so that's a really easy way. Uh, to access this, so I recommend setting this. Let me angle this up so you can see. This function, custom function button on the top deck, I prefer setting that to drive mode. And then um, I actually leave that to the default behavior. I think you do as well, Josh, right? To right? ISO, yeah. 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 And the default behavior there is ISO control. Yes. So I like having drive mode and ISO right next to each and other. And I actually do the same. Although I use drive mode differently, um, I keep it there because for me, I am bouncing between single and continuous medium often as for my car stuff that I do. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention about drive modes and something that I had to address maybe two, three weeks ago is if you are in one of the continuous, there's four different continuous modes. Keep in mind that if you go to either of the two fastest modes, which would be high speed or very high speed, the camera is not going to be focusing or white balancing in between frames because it's too quick. So if you are shooting somebody running at you or something that requires the focusing in continuous mode, continuous focusing mode being adjusted as you're firing off frames, you don't want to go faster than medium speed or else the camera is basically locking the focus. So if you're shooting a panning shot, like a car driving by, you don't need focus because the plane of focus isn't changing. If that car was coming at me or it's in some lateral lateral direction, then you would not want to be on high speed because again, you're not going to have focusing in between each frame. So you'll have one in focus shot and a bunch of out of focus shots. So something to keep in mind that I wanted to mention for drive mode, um, the very high speed drive mode uses the electronic shutter. I can't think of a time that I've needed to use it, but I'm sure there are some specialty applications um, where it could be useful. Um, we've talked about this before on the show, but we'll cover it again. Um, David and I really don't do time-lapse photography, so the interval shooting menu, we're not using it for that. But one of the things you can use it for is a custom self-timer. Yeah. We've talked about this, I'll show it again. Essentially, if you think of interval shooting as a certain number of images spaced out by a certain amount of time that you can delay the start of, you could do one image by itself, and then the amount of time you delay the start of it is the same thing as a self-timer, which is just delaying the start of your picture taking. So if I choose my number of frames as one... And this, you can use the touchscreen. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, like that. I just don't want to get fingerprints all over. Yeah. <laughs> and the interval in this case doesn't matter because it's one frame, so meaning the interval is how much time <laughs> in between. I can pick any number of hours, minutes, or seconds. So if I wanted a five-second self-timer, I just simply choose one frame with a five second countdown. What if you want a one hour self timer? You could have it. Um, <laughs> you could have any self timer you want. So if you're doing a, maybe you're shooting with a super long lens and you want something that not, it's not 12 seconds, but two seconds is too short. Maybe you want five or six seconds. You can use interval with one frame and a five second countdown to make a self timer of any length that you want. So something cool. I wanted to mention. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've talked about multi-shot on the show before. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much you want to dive into it now, but essentially give us the, just so they, if they're new to it, give us the very, very quick rundown of what multi-shot is. Yeah, we could do a very quick. The wider shot. Yeah. They don't have to look at the back of my blind camera here. Okay, there. There we are. Uh, multi-shot basically is using the, because the SL2 and the SL2S have sensor-based image stabilization. The sensor actually moves around and it's very precisely controlled. So multi-shot is using that mechanism to shift half a pixel in every direction for eight frames. And it shoots remarkably quickly. You have to be on a tripod. Mm -hmm. And then it stitches them together in camera. For the SL2, you're getting 187 megapixel, which is 
Crazy. Bananas. <laughs> That's a technical term. Yes. And then on the SL2S, you're getting 96 megapixels, which is also really good. And that addresses, and we talked about this on our SL2S episode, that the SL2S is, yes, 24 megapixel, which for some people, oh, that's not enough for landscape or architecture. Well, great. It has multi-shot. And you can get 96 megapixel images using that multi-shot mode. There are some limitations. You can uh, only shoot a longest frame of one second because that would be an eight second exposure. And it's using an electronic shutter. And it's using an electronic shutter. Yeah. So there's a limitation there. Yeah. But within the bounds of of the technical capabilities, it, it is pretty astounding the quality that you get. Yes. And the fact that it combines it in camera and gives you an editable DNG is phenomenal. But I don't use it as often as I probably should because the other thing that you can't use together is you can't use exposure bracketing and multi-shot. Mm, true. So you have to, and, and maybe the reason they put them in a drive mode menu that way is you can't use them both at the same time. You could do it's one of the manually other. bracketed multi shots, and and I've done that. Yeah, but yeah. you can't do yeah right. You can't do auto bracketing. Yeah, it's just too many things happening. You know, I think down the line, if they continue to expand the range of cameras that have sensor based stabilization, mm -hmm. um, we'll probably see multi shot integrated in different ways, or them using that technology in different ways. So I'm excited. This is it's really their force foray into that. So you know, the future is bright. The future is now. I hope. Anyway, now. so okay, so that was a very quick that's multi shot explanation of multi shot, and mm -hmm. I think that pretty much covers drive, um, yeah. drive mode. Yeah, I, think I don't so. think we missed. Oh, anything. I am going to add on to your interval shooting. Mm, tell me. Here's what I the only thing I use interval shooting for. Yes, on our wonderful trips when I want to take a group photo. That's <laughs> yes, a fair point. So you could set the old way is you set a 10 second or 12 second self timer. You're like, okay, ready, and you've actually seen me do this. Yes, and it's like you, you push the button and then you're running, running, running. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you stand there and, it, yeah. and the picture goes, and no, 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 nobody move. You run back to the camera, you hit the button again, you run back, okay, everyone look. And that's it, right? So I smartened up and I use interval and I do like 10, 15 frames at two second intervals with a 10 second delay. See, I use the Photos app, so. No, but this way I don't have to be pushing anything. I know, but I'm saying I use Photos app and self timer so I can see. No. I think it's cool. Okay. It's like but the anyway, ultimate selfie tool. But yeah. it works. It works yes, great. That's true. Yes, it does work. So if you're going to do family photos, this is a great way to do family photos. And it's like a photo booth kind of thing. So everyone kind of knows that every two seconds you're taking a picture so you can have different looks. And then about halfway through, you're like, okay, now everyone just go crazy and jump around. And, you know, kids like that. So uh, grownups too. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Very Mo nice. Moving right along. All right. What so do that, we got was, that was our drive mode. Mm, super brief. The next one is going to be even more complicated. So let's let's dive right in. Okay. Which is the focusing menu. Oh um, boy. This is, you know, has been added on to. And if you are, when I say added on to, I mean through firmware. If you're an M shooter, this is the most foreign menu to you, of course, because you don't have autofocus. You just have manual focus. So if you're coming into an SL system camera with SL lenses or any L mount autofocus lenses for the first time, this menu is probably going to be the one that you are sort of hesitant about because you just haven't shot with autofocus. Well, maybe you had another autofocus camera, but that's... We don't talk about, we don't we, talk we, about we, those cameras. We don't talk about those cameras. So let's get into this a little bit. Um, in our focusing menu, which is, again, this is just menu, menu. It's the second item down on the first page. And we can joystick our way into that. The first thing we see is our focus mode. This is something that David and I both change immediately when we start shooting. Um, you see four different modes, intelligent, S, C, and MF. So I'll go through them quickly, and David, feel free to chime in. For sure. Intelligent autofocus is essentially a combination of AFS and AFC. What the camera's doing is identifying what you're photographing, and if that thing begins to move, it will switch from autofocus single to autofocus continuous in real time. Mm -hmm. It's not... Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer because Intelligent AF sounds like it's doing something fancier than that, but it's really not. It's really just, and it, it, you think about it, it makes sense. If it's in this menu, it's going to relate to the things going on in here. And it's essentially just making sure, let's say you're photographing a person, if they're standing there, you're going to be on single because you don't want to be on continuous because it's photographing a static subject because it's going to be trying constantly to think it's moving. And as soon as, let's say the person starts to move, then it's going to switch over to AFC. I don't usually use this, do you? Uh, I do use this 
sometimes. I, I'll use it for video, for mm, instance. Okay. So, like, if I'm doing selfie video right. or, or something like that, I'll set a camera. You know, in other words, I don't have Jose to help out in the <laughs> studio. I'll set the camera uh, on an intelligent AF and then use the, the face and body, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. And it generally keeps my face in focus. So if I'm moving around, it'll it'll follow me. Okay. But like Josh is saying, rather than in continuous tracking mode, it's I find continuous AFC to be kind of stuttery where it's going to try to constantly move and focus. Right. Which is I, fine for when your something is moving. It is, but not for something that's personally not I mean, I don't I don't use AF continuous ever. I can't even think when I've used it last. Yeah. I'm either you and and frankly, if we're talking about this, what's the one thing that I change it to that I'm sure you change it to? Well, that's well. what I'm, I'm getting there. So right. You want to? If you if we go back to our, our focus menu here, so um, go back here. AFS is AF single, meaning you have to press the shutter, and the camera auto focuses and it stays there. AFC autofocus continuous. Half press the shutter, and the camera is continuously trying to autofocus on whatever is underneath your focus point forever. Regardless of whether it's moving or not, it's going to keep trying. The fourth mode, MF, is manual focus. And that is the mode that David and I use overwhelmingly the most. Now, you may say, well, Josh, why are you putting it in manual focus? The whole point of the SL2 with SL lenses is it has autofocus. And I say, yeah, that's true. Here's the thing. Leica, which they started this in the S system back in 08, putting the camera in MF mode doesn't remove autofocusing from the camera. It simply removes autofocusing from the shutter button. And when you think about it, the way the camera is set up by default, the way most cameras like this are set up by default, you have two extremely important controls tied together on one button. You have the action of activating your focus and the action of firing the shutter and taking the photo, both assigned to the shutter button. And my logic is, why would I want two incredibly important things that may not also happen at the same time? There may be a separation of those actions. Why would I want those two things on one button? when I can separate them and put them on their own respective buttons. Essentially, that's what putting the focus mode in MF is doing, is it's removing the action of autofocusing from the shutter and reassigning it automatically to the joystick button. So if I put the camera in MF, oops, here we go, and I were to half press the shutter, nothing happens, I'm half pressing, nothing's happening. And if I were to tap the joystick or press the joystick button in, I'm not gonna, Oh, it's going to try. It's going to try very hard to focus on the table. But anyway, it's trying to. It's activating the autofocus. Except if I'm going to stick my hand in it. But yeah, I don't it's think that focus it, that close. Uh, actually, that's oh, that's pretty good. Uh, oh, wow, that's uh, that's because that's 24. Anyway, surprising. So this is called back button focus, which is a technique that a lot of sports photographers use and a lot of old school pros have been using forever. And you are again separating the action of activating the autofocus from taking the photo. And combined with what we'll talk about in a minute with the focus points, you have essentially, you're using your thumb for anything related to focus and your, which one is this called? Index finger? Four finger. Four finger, the big one. Index finger, yeah, index, yeah. Index I'm finger. kidding. The index finger for taking the photo. So this is basically muscle memory for us now. Mm -hmm. If you've never used it before, it's a little bit like, at first, like trying to rub your stomach and tap your head at the same time. Like it feels a little bit like, but I promise you, as you get used to it, you'll find yourself with a higher percentage of in-focus photos and less photos that are in the center because you're more encouraged to move your focus point around and activate your autofocus. And thoughts on that? Well, I just realized I don't know. Albert, now you're watching this show and you're in Iceland right he now. Is so in Iceland, yeah. <laughs> That's I love it. I love the dedication. And they show that. and they shot Aurora, which is awesome. Sweet. Okay, so get out of there. I'm going to just move that for a second. Oh, we had it all set up so nice. I did. But I want to show this, the other, the other, oops, oh, that's super dirty. Great. And now I'm not going to have a lot here because it's a 75. We don't have a wider lens, do we? Uh, I didn't bring a 1635. Oh. I have a 35. Oh, let's use that. I have a 50. The 35. I don't have a 35. Let's, a 50. 50 is great. I'm just seeing my 24, but I don't want to take a look. No, 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 no. It's fine. Okay. But I want to show on. Yeah, this is, we've talked about this before, but it's absolutely worth explaining again. Absolutely. So let's say I'm going to shoot this at, oh, it's an SL2S, so I'm going to shoot at f11, which we're not going to get into the reasons why, but let's just talk. Okay, so now I'm in manual focus. And if I start turning the focus ring on the lens, let me bring that forward, you can see 
my focus scale is changing and I have these things up. Well, if I let go, you can't see it. All right, so you have to have your finger back, front, focus, and front. You have yeah. to have the shutter halfway pressed. Yeah, and you have to have been turning the ring. So these two things have to happen. If I just turn the ring, nothing's happening. If I just half press the shutter, nothing's happening. I have to half press the shutter and turn the ring, and you'll see that those line up. Now, I'm not actually looking at that. I'm looking at my screen, my monitor here. So I'm going to dial that to infinity if I can get there. Let's see, 24, 32. Got ways to go. Uh, OK, there infinity. So with a 50 millimeter lens at f11, hyperfocal distance is 6.2 meters to infinity. And the great thing about decoupling it is when I half press to take a photo, or full press to take a photo, it's not refocusing. My focus is set. And normally, I'm not using a 50 millimeter lens. I'm using a much wider lens. I'm using, let's say, uh, a 24 to 90 or a 16 to 35. And I have much, much more depth of field. So on a 16 millimeter at f8 on this camera, I'm going to have the depth of field of about two meters to infinity in focus, which is basically, if I'm on a tripod at this position, uh, it's going to be my feet all the way as far as I can see. So everything is in focus. And yeah. it takes a lot of the guesswork out yeah. of landscape photography because you don't have to think about what to focus on. And you don't have to worry that the camera is going to hunt and it can't see in the dark. Right? Yeah. This, well, this is probably the most underutilized focus feature on the SL cameras is that depth of field scale. It is extremely useful. And I don't know if I was paying attention. I don't think you talked about using the autofocus as your tape measure. Uh, no, I didn't talk about that yet. One of the things David will do to take advantage of this camera's of that function in the camera is he'll actually focus on something and then refer to the top display to see how far away that distance is and then work backwards from that when yep. he's doing his up the field calculations on the screen. That is also true. So if you if you are watching the show enough and know that we can't stand shooting past like f11 or f8 depending on the camera, then you would say, well, how do you get depth of field and how do you make sure that you have the depth of field you need? That's how we do it. Yes. And does this work with non Leica L mount lenses? I don't know. I don't but actually know. Here, Jose, come to the two of us here. So do we know, Jose? Oh, both. There we go. Wait, uh, does it work with non SL2 lenses? Like like uh, Panasonic or Sigma L mount lenses? I I believe it does. I believe it does work. So uh, if anyone can verify yeah, that. Yeah, if anyone has a non yeah. L mount lens. Well, we'll find out. We'll, we'll find out. Say it on the, in the chat. Um, because we don't have any not Leica lenses here on our Leica themed show. I'm sorry, but I am curious to know. So you please feel free I, to throw it in the my, chat. My guess would be yes. My guess is that to be an L mount approved lens, yeah. it would work with that focus scale. But I'd rather know for sure. So And no, yeah. it doesn't work if you put a manual M lens on there because it doesn't know the distance. Exactly. You so you have to have the, the stepper motors. But, but this works with the zooms, it works with the primes. It's it it's a real time display. So as you're turning Amazing. the focus ring and half pressing the shutter, it's and changing your aperture, all those things, it's going to be showing you the depth of field in real time. So this is yes. awesome. So as a landscape photographer, I mean, I live by that. And yet when I take the camera off the tripod and I'm just doing handheld detail shots or people shots or whatever, walking around, I'm just hitting that back button to focus and then shooting. So yeah. it's that muscle memory that Josh is talking about. It's this sort of focus. I'm exaggerating, obviously. Focus, wait for it to turn green, and click. It also means that your thumb is on the joystick where you can move that focus point around and then lock it in. Um, or depending on how we have it set up, you can also use the touch screen mm -hmm while you're in EVF, so you're looking through the camera, you can actually use the touch screen itself to move your focus point around mm -hmm. and then half press. So um, both of us definitely will use MF 90% of the time. Yeah, 95% of the time. Like 95 it's pretty rare for me to get out of MF. Like I can't remember the last time that I, I know. I, and, I can't and yet, think. And that the reality is either I'm focusing by number, which is actually manual focus, except not really. It's by it's by math, uh, or I'm using the back button manual focus for autofocus activation. And well, using we, have some, we have some. But it doesn't work with the lumps twenty four at one hundred five. Lumix, Lumix, Lumix. I like the lumps. It's the lumps lens, and oh. it, I can't see your hands on the way. It works with 
Lamas, not... wait, what? Oh, I see what they're doing. Lamas, <laughs> what? <laughs> Purposely not saying the names. So, so it's not to sully the purity of our, like, no, it's fine. We know they exist, okay? It's okay. I mean, <laughs> Laika invited them, so, That's you know. so funny. Thank you for, cool. yeah, thank thank you you for checking that out. Um, so, okay, so it appears that some lenses, do, it does work with, and other ones it doesn't wait, work with. I know but... Eli and Jack are watching the show. You guys have Sigma Prime, so mm. put mm -hmm. it in there if they, if they, if they work or not. Uh, okay, Moving back to on. focusing. Uh, okay, so we covered, uh, where are we? Here we go. We covered the first item in that menu, which is focus mode. The next one we're going to go to is AF mode. So if we go into AF mode, which again, I'm just right joysticking, we've got a bunch of options of which I use basically one. David probably uses two or three. Maybe I use two. I don't know. Anyway, you want to avoid at pretty much all costs the first multi field, one. The first <laughs> yeah. one, which happens to be the default. Ugh. No matter how smart these cameras get, in the end, you are the artist and you are the, the one who decides your subject. If you have the camera in multi-field, multi-field for the AF mode, I mean, not for metering, it's different. What you're basically doing is allowing the camera to decide your subject and allowing your camera to decide what should be in focus. So never, ever, ever, ever use multi-field because you're just throwing your hands up and saying, all right, camera, you do it for me. You figure out what the subject could be. And maybe sometimes it'll get it, but why would you want to be at the mercy of the camera when you could decide yourself and you should be deciding yourself? So... The first thing I do when I go from my reset here is I get out of multi-field and I'm going to be in one of two modes, oops, which is going to be either spot or field. Now, the difference is between these two is simply the size of the focusing area. So if I go to spot, which is the next one down, let's see if, it'll, if we can see it. Uh, you put uh, something dark under there. Yeah, you can see you get a little crosshair. I'm just putting my hand here so I can you can see that. And using the joystick button, I can move the crosshair around like so. I can double tap the screen and put it back in the center if I want. Show that one more time. Put it here. Double tap the center of the screen. Comes right back. If you lose it, it's okay. That's how you get it back. And this is going to be for small subjects. So if I'm photographing a car and I'm trying to get the hood emblem or the wheel, or if I'm doing a portrait and I want to get just the, the eye, this is for that type of subject matter. Where this could be more challenging and where I would switch to what I'm going to talk about next is if you have a larger subject, so larger areas of single tone, because what's underneath the focus point has to have some type of contrast in order for the camera to focus on it. So if you were to try to put that little tiny crosshair on, like if I tried to do it on a car door that was a large area of single tone, it may struggle because there's just not enough contrast under that tiny, tiny area it's looking at. So in those situations, and really the mode I use the most is going to be field. Field is simply a larger focus point. In this case, it is probably about 10 times the size of the crosshair, if I were to take a guess. And this is what you're going to use most of the time. This is going to give you a good balance between not too much area, but not too little area. And then I'll show them a trick as well with that. Oh, I was just about to show it. So. Well, it's my turn. Okay. Uh, oh, no, no, you go, you go, you go. Okay. It's David Stern. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. You need a lens cap. No, I'm just going to make it dark. Ah, look at you. Hey, look, look at, at you me. Being clever and stuff. And take it out of auto. There we go. Making it very dark. Okay. So on my camera here, you can see that I've, that I've, yes, it's not quite dark enough, but there it is. So I've got my field, and that's the default size. It shows up in the middle. Yes, we can move it around with the joystick. You can also move it around just by touching as you can see here, and it will attempt to focus, although unsuccessfully, because there's no, there, I mean, there's nothing there. Uh, I'm photographing the table at an inch away, less than an inch away. So the thing that Josh is about to show you, which is pretty cool, is if you push and hold on that, you'll notice that it comes up with two little red triangles in the corner. And if I use, whoop, no, not that. Let's try that again. Okay, if I use the back dial, it has three settings. It has a small, the default medium, and a large. So this can be really handy. Josh mentioned a car door that's kind of a large field. You can make that field much larger to try to find contrast in there. Or if you want, I think the small field is a really good balance, especially mm -hmm. for portraiture, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. between that extreme small spot and the medium-sized field. So I usually bounce between 
the medium field for just general walk around photography. But if I want to really dial in shallow depth of field, shooting wide open, uh, trying to get an eyeball, I'm going to use the small field. And then to, to say, okay, basically you just half press the shutter and then that point will go away. And what David did by accident, but I think a lot of people don't realize you could do with the same scenario is if you press and hold and get the little red arrows, uh, meaning that it's now changeable in size, but instead of turning the back dial, you turn the top dial, that's actually a quick way to get to your different AF modes. Yeah. So if you run out of custom functions and you want another way to change your AF mode, you can do that. So that's just a little... That is a little head and drip. Yeah. All right. Um, Keep it rolling. I, yes. So again, I'm generally bouncing between field, oops, field and spot. Zone is like a bunch of spots, which I never use. Um, <laughs> tracking. The reality is the tracking on the SL2 and the S2S is a heck of a lot better than it used to be. It's not as good as some of the mainstream brands that I've been doing sports cameras for 25 years. Um, I don't use it a lot. I use it sometimes like for cars, but... The next mode is a mode David uses a lot. I do. So I'm going to let him talk about it. And this also addresses a question in the chat, which is about handing the camera to a stranger for a family photo. For sure. David. So that, that mode is unfocusing, and it's eye, face, and body detection. That's been expanded. Basically, the eye has been added. It used to just be called face and body detection if you're not on the latest firmware. Get on the latest firmware and you'll see it this way, eye, face, and body detection. There is no way to adjust that. You just select it. And the thing is, it looks just like field right now because I'm not looking at a person. So we would actually have to photograph. Yeah, there's not a good way to show this. There's not a great way to show this because I can't show the back of my camera while also shooting Josh, but we can sort of, but what I could do, oh, maybe this will work. This is going to be a little, a little weird, but we're going to try it. Okay. Can we do that? Oh, now I need the longer lens. <laughs> you're right there. Okay. We're doing our best here. Yeah. I can pull up a portrait of a person on my phone. Oh, no, no, look, right there. Oh, you're going to shoot us. We're going to shoot us. Okay. So this is in st in studio. Let's see if you guys can see this. Mm. Uh, maybe not. Mm. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Like I said, we're still experimenting oh, with this all right camera work. setup. Here. Maybe a, how about this? I'll pull up a picture on my phone. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, like that. Like a, like yeah. a, it's fine. Any portrait, if you have one. I We're mean, getting it. We want to. We want to show it. So, here. Not that one. <laughs> Let's try one with a, That's a little bit bigger too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm great. I'm great. doing amazing. So good. This is so good Top right now. Quality. That's like, it's like Google something. No. Well, you don't want to show someone in, in, in on the show. I guess that's not gonna work. You don't want that. Here, that's me. Okay. There we. There we go. Okay. Now let's see. If oh, this, I see. What you're this is going to be problematic. You are. I'm, you are just going for gold here. Aren't I am. You? I, I love am, it. I am. But now he's committed, so I'm not going to let him. I'm not going to move on to anything else until. Oh, this is horrible. He's going to watch me flounder. <laughs> oh, it's quite fun for me. Okay. You want me to hold it? Well, will this work? Put it on your little stand. Oh my goodness! What, what little you, stand? What here are we you go. doing over here? Oh my gosh. This, this isn't going to work. This is working out. This is this is not going to work at all. Really well. No, this isn't going to work at all. Nope. So well, you have to take our word for it that it works. It works, <laughs> but not like this. So let's not, let's not do this. Yeah. Ever. So face and body detection, eye, face, body, it detects eye, face, and body. It says that symbol. So we'll find a way to demonstrate it at some point. Yeah. Um, the way it looks, let's just talk generally about it. Yeah. Um, not like that. There we go. Wow. Fix your tripod there, bro. Thank you. There what happened? Is. Well, you put it on a different lens. Oh, that's right. I did. I just did. You're a disaster. I am a disaster. Okay, so the way it works is instead of this box here, what you would see is a box around any human subject. And if someone has their back turned to you, it will draw a box around the whole body shape. That's the body detection. They turn around, then it'll find the face, and it'll be a little weird because there'll also be two smaller boxes on the eyes. If there's multiple people in the scene, it'll track multiple people, and you'll have little arrows that you can use the joystick to go sideways and to select which person and which eyes specifically within the face you want to track. Yeah. So you can actually track, let's say, you know, the front eye or the back eye in a portrait. It is really useful, especially for video applications. And especially, like Josh said, if you hand it off to a not with you and not a photographer person because they don't have to know too much 
they'd be like, oh, yeah, look, the box is around you. That's great. And they snap a picture and yeah. you're in focus. Yeah. But, yeah. I love how he says, this is going to be a little weird, but we're going to try it. That's your motto. Yes. <laughs> that, is, that is the Red Dot Pro Camera Talk motto. It is. It is. Uh, we're just going to try it because it's pretty, you know, whatever. The show is free. You're not paying for this. We'll do whatever we want. Okay. We want to be weird. Okay. We're going to be weird. What are you going to do about it? You just just don't go away. Oh, okay. All right, we got it. We got so much more to cover. So and we, much more. It is so late. Eli, I think you found out you have to use the focus switch on the lens. Thank you, Eli, for testing. Oh, okay. It, um, for the manual focus. Okay. Next, it's already almost nine. So wow. okay, we're Let's gonna have to do along. seventeen more parts on the SL two. And then no, we're no, no, no. Next, we have focus assist. So we finished our AF modes. We're now going into focus assist. We see a couple of things here that I will explain quickly. Auto magnification, we leave that on. That's just like, if you manually focus, it magnifies automatically. The next one is a question we have to answer often, which is where you change the color of your focus peaking. That's where that is. And then your sensitivity. Neither of us use focus peaking. I know that's gonna shock some people. I find it gets in the way. I just use my eyes and magnification to see. I find the focus peaking is just isn't accurate enough. It tends to hide the thing I'm actually trying to focus on and gets in my way. So on every camera that I use, M11, SL2, whatever, focus speaking is always turned off. Even with like Noctiluxes and stuff, I just use the magnification. I'm not saying I just do it all full screen. I use I use the magnification, but I don't use speaking. Um, AF setup. This is where you can decide the behavior of the tracking focus, meaning the continuous autofocus as it's tracking a subject. There are different profiles that are customizable to based, basically it's controlling how sensitive the focus is to changing when something's moving and how sensitive it is to changing when something crosses the path. So I see you're shooting football and the, um, are they umpires or referees? I don't even know. Referees. Referees. <laughs> <Not referees. laughs> so umpires, umpires, baseball. umpires baseball. There's, totally, there's at least one umpire in football. I'm sure of it. Somebody told me something once. No. Nope. Um, you can nope. see what I do on Sundays, which is, you know, work, but um, it's gonna, you know, if they get in the way, it's not gonna quickly try to focus on them. So you can change the modes here, and you can also actually customize each individual mode to That's tailor. A, does exactly. it say runner? It does. Wow. Okay. Can I? Oh wow. Team sports. And it does explain it. There's little explanations here. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, since we don't do a lot of continuous tracking, um, I never. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna say right now. I never use this. Yeah. No, no but I, we still should acknowledge that it exists. So it exists. But what I do want to talk about in AF setup is um, start position. We just, that's just where, we, when it's done tracking, if it, it snaps back to center, just leave it there. Pre focus. Mm. Now, if you are trying your best to preserve battery life, turn pre focus off. What pre focus is, is the camera is constantly depth mapping, it's constantly checking the distances of whatever's in front of it even when you're not actually focusing, so that it's that much more ready to focus to the correct distance. So it's constantly taking, it's not constantly focusing, it's constantly taking readings of the of the, the distances of everything that's in the scene, uh, which of course uses some power. It makes focusing a heck of a lot faster, but it will drain your battery more. So if you are limited by battery life, if you're down to your last battery or whatever, turn off pre-focus and you will extend your battery life. Now, if you know how I shoot, I refuse to shoot around battery life, so I bring like, Five batteries with me for a full day, depending on how far or how long I'm going to be out. How many do you take usually for a day? Uh, four. Four? Yeah. Okay. Four or five. So I don't worry about it. But if you're short on batteries or you it's really cold or who knows, um, you can turn off pre-focus and that will save a bit of battery life. Um, I leave it on because I like speed. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one... I can talk about that one. Is, well, I'm just going to introduce it and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll say, This is a feature that was added in firmware. Mm -hmm. So we didn't start with this. We got this later on, and David will talk about it. Go. I will. Here I am. There talking you are. about this. Oh, let's move that up. There we go. So uh, under MF setup, standard MF is essentially, how do we describe this? I'm going to use this lens here. That's, just, that's the, that's the non-linear. Yeah. So this is, this is non-linear accelerometer-based focus. So all of the SL lenses, the autofocus lenses, are fly-by-wire. There is no mechanical linkage in the focus ring of the lens that actually moves any glass. It's it's a ring, and there's some magnets in there, and it measures the change in polarity and all that. Ooh, polarity. I know. It's exciting. Throwing that word in today. Yep. So, so the fast, the original way that it came out, 
way back in 2015, and it lasted for a while, was if the slower you turn the lens to focus, I mean, it would barely move mm -hmm. to the point of not moving. If you turn slow enough, it wouldn't move at all. If you quickly move kind of a short burst, but really fast, it would change the focus a lot. So that's the standard focus behavior. It's sort of this predictive, smart uh, accelerator based. It's annoying is what it is. We don't like it. So, <laughs> But we were uh, stuck with it for a long time. So standard MF is the way it was for a long time. And especially for video applications, pulling focus repeatedly, meaning you know actually trying to have a, a, a smooth follow focus from a foreground to a background or back and forth was almost was just excruciating and not repeatable. So what they did is they put in this MF setup, and you can see here different degree markings from maximum, which is confusing because what is the maximum? <laughs> Is it more? more is it, it's more it's, than 360. It's the maximum, yeah. Yeah, so 360 is one full turn around all the way down to 90. So that means, and I'm going to scoot up here again. That means that if I grab my lens and I go 90 degrees, just like that, that's going to be close focus and that's going to be infinity. If I'm at 180, it's going to mean that I'm at close focus and now I'm at infinity. So this is it's repeatable. Um, this is a great example of why Leica has drifted away from printed instruction manuals. This is a major feature that they added in firmware. So if they give you a printed instruction manual from day one, it wouldn't be in there. But if you go and you download the instruction manual, this feature is in there because they're updating the manual whenever they add new features. So you can always gain instructions on the latest and greatest additions um, to the firmware by downloading the manual. So I wanted to mention that. Yeah, I've yeah. used this, this feature a lot, actually. It's pretty cool. For video or stills? For video, more than anything. Okay. Um, you know, instead of using M lenses, which usually is easier to focus manually, this makes it much easier for the SL lenses. Um, for yeah, for manual. What focus. setting so, do you like to use? Um, usually, I'll go to the fastest one. Ninety. To yeah. Yeah, it's like using a zoom right on the M. So that's like super quick throw. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And you see it, you know, you see the focus changing right away, and it's you know. Much easier. So. I mean, it is kind of cool that you have adjustable focus throw yeah. for manual focus. Yeah. If you are choosing to use manual focus. Yeah. It's cool. And it was a welcome addition to the firmware because we had been. Yeah, since there are no markings on the lens, you can see right away the change and you'd have to, you know, keep turning it. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. So, that's something we change also. We'll. Correct. I like 360 because it just feels no, right. No, no. I do. What I, do you like? I like 120. Well, you're just a renegade like that. I am a renegade. <laughs> I like 360, so sue me. Um, anyway, well, so that's yeah. That is the focus menu. So we've gone through probably the two big ones. So now we can kind of um, bounce through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So focus uh, uh, metering is another one that we should talk about. Yeah, you should cover metering and specifically sure. the, the new metering mode that we got in firmware. Yes. So let's let's talk about that. Oh, I feel it's not quite happening. Okay. Uh, so the metering mode, you'll see defaults to multi-field. Mm, no. I mean, it's okay. Multi-field is fine. Uh, but in the past, prior to this more recent firmware update, I would use center-weighted most of the time. Maybe that's because I'm an old-fashioned... But you use center-weighted? Yeah. Wow, you are old-fashioned. I, I always use multi-field on exposure metering. That's funny. So I usually use center-weighted metering. Interesting. Um, because that's what M metering is like. That's just what traditional... Not anymore. That's not anymore, <laughs> but previously yeah. we use center weight. Okay. That just means that about two-thirds of the center is weighted more than the periphery. Now, I just leave it right here, which is my favorite highlight weighted metering mm. that has now been rolled out to the SL2, SL2S, the Q2, the Q2 monochrome, and the M11. This is the best thing <laughs> since highlight weighted metering. Tell us why. So we're always going on and on and on about protect your highlights, expose for the highlights, pull up your shadows later, because digital cameras just don't have that dynamic range and recoverability in highlights that they do in shadows. So we're always pushing, pushing, pushing. Do not blow your highlights out. Do not blow your highlights out. Highlight weighted metering, it's not perfect. It doesn't protect you 100% but it's gonna get you about 80% of the way there in most circumstances. 
you approach a scene, especially landscape photography or high contrast lighting in the middle of the day with really dark shadows and bright highlights, it's going to veer itself towards the highlights, which means your pictures are going to look darker on the back of your camera, which is a good thing because it means that you are now able to pull up all that shadow information while retaining your highlight detail. Please, please use this, love this. End of end of speech. <laughs> so, David, one of the things I think that's that's relevant here is when you're using highlight weighted metering, what are your pictures going to look like when they're just on the screen of your camera? I mean, dark. Exactly. So it doesn't mean something's wrong. In fact, it means something's right. Because as David has talked about many, 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 many times, he doesn't shoot for out of camera. He shoots for the final image, which includes post-processing, which of course is a critical part of the workflow to get results that you're happy with. So. I'm gonna throw that in there. What do you got? Oh, you got a memory card with some stuff on it? Uh, maybe. Okay, it looks like a lot of bracketed stuff. Yeah, this is all bracketed stuff, Pretty which nice. is interesting, actually. We can, might show, be, we can yeah. show it. Jose, we're gonna pull up David's thing. Here you go. So just as why, a, you, why is it crooked? You spent like 20 minutes before the show started. But I know. Crooked, and I now that, you just ruined it. Well, because I can't get this lower. There we go. We're losing subscribers. Oh, no, okay. no, no, no. There we go. That's better. That's a sweet shot. Okay, so this is this is exposure bracketing. First of all, everyone's always asking, David, what do your photos look like out of camera? Oh, there now you can see them on a tiny screen. Okay. Shot with another camera. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so let me turn that off. There so that go. that's my my under exposing for the highlights. That's my normal shot. And that's my overexposed mm. trying to produce more shadow detail, as you can see in there. You're using bracketing here? And this is bracketing off a moving boat, shooting another moving boat. Nice. But the camera's so fast. See, I say I don't use continuous, except in bracketing, it automatically shoots as fast as possible. So this was taken very, very quickly. You can see there's not really any motion between these shots. And when I stitch them together in Lightroom, combining it to uh, HDR, it looks fine. But what I would say is highlight weighted metering is going to look somewhere around here. Not there like you might be used to seeing your photos, but it's going to be a little darker. Nice. And I don't know if there is something. Well, while you're finding that, I'll mention well, here. Yeah, oh, I mean, you found something? Okay. No, I'm just saying, like, okay. you can see it's going to look pretty dark. Right. And if I put up a histogram, you'll notice on my histogram, it looks like it's underexposed. That's like a textbook perfect histogram right there. Beautiful. But for most people, they'd be like, why is it so far to the right. left? Right, right, right. Yes, right. because I'm shooting that way to protect highlights. And I am using highlight weighted metering. But if you look at almost and these are just these are just a bunch of shots and you look at all these histograms you'll notice there's nothing to the right now i can't promise these are fantastic pictures but there you go i know like we get the idea in terms of like yeah these are just, this is your raw take like this is a very very bright image this is a lot of light tones and yet i don't have i have a lot of room on this side of my histogram and there is plenty of there's plenty of detail in here so i'm able to pull up pull out this this highlight area here that's sort of like misty, mist, misty, moody stuff uh, without losing all that highlight information. Yeah. So really highly recommend uh, using that. And you're not, to answer rate. the question about will the M10 get this? No, um, you essentially need to have the sensor, the camera sensor taking the meter readings to have this functionality work. The M11 doesn't have a meter on the shutter. It only meters off the sensor. Same thing as the Q2 and the SL2. The M10, like all of its predecessors in the M line, uses a patch on the shutter to take a meter reading. So, unfortunately, not unless they come up with some clever way to force live view, like they used to do on the 240 with the advanced metering, and that drove everybody crazy. So, I doubt we'll see it uh, at this point, since the M10 has now been replaced by the M11. In case you didn't know, <laughs> it is the current the current model. So. Excellent cool. job explaining highlight weighted metering. And I think the reality is that the highlight weighted metering existing is going to help a lot of people get better landscape photos by kind of compelling them in a gentle way to expose what we would say is correctly for the post-processing pipeline yes. to get the results you're happy with versus trying to get it perfect in camera and then losing some really valuable highlight information in your clouds or in snow that you're never going to be able to get back. Accurate. Uh, we never use bot metering ever. Um, I use multi-field all the time. Um, David and I both are huge uh, fans of exposure compensation. 
Mm -hmm. We do not let ourselves be at the mercy of the canvas meter. If we don't like what it's doing, we simply compensate with exposure compensation. So Ooh. keep that in mind. Expose, ex compensate with exposure we comp compensation. We compensate with compensation. I mean, that's why it's called <laughs> compensation because you're basically giving the camera a little eh, little nudge like, hey, buddy, like, <laughs> just, do this, just do this for me. Uh, I'm just saying. All right, so that is metering. Oh, look at the next thing, exposure compensation. I think this is a touch a touch sensitive one. Yay. Yeah, but it, I never do, use that. Do, do, do. No, I just use the top dial for that. Yeah, why don't um, we show that? Why don't we show that? Yeah, so if you are in um, regular light aperture view. priority mode, here we go, like that, the top dial by default is exposure compensation. So you can see my image is getting darker or brighter, previewing that. So I am, if you were to look through all of our images, aside from bracketed ones, probably 80% of them have some type of compensation dialed in. I'm usually negative, but it depends on the scene that I'm shooting. Well, I think you should be more of an optimist, Josh. No, if you know me, you know that's, that's <laughs> not the case. <laughs> I'm, also, I'm also talking about vintage uh, M lenses, then yes, very optimistic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the next one, pretty straightforward, ISO. This but is like I you, showed, where you yeah. pick your ISO. We both use the top right button for ISO, which is, of course, the factory default, which is convenient. You can set any other button you like to it, but we just happen to like the top button. Um, auto ISO settings. I could talk about that one. I was just about to kick it over to you. Wow, thank you, Josh. <laughs> You're welcome. That's great. Right, well, then we're talking about auto ISO. I am a big fan of auto ISO. Yes. Unless I'm on a tripod. Mm, that okay. right there is like the thing to understand about auto yeah, ISO. Yeah, yeah. Explain. Okay, so auto ISO is is a fantastic tool. Um, I also shoot aperture priority. What I'm doing using the combination of aperture priority and auto ISO with the right settings, I'm basically shooting camera assisted manual. Mm. If that matters, if that makes sense, we're gonna we're gonna walk through this briefly. Yeah, my maximum ISO is going to depend on the camera I'm using. So on the SL2. I'm going to be a little more conservative. I'm probably going to set that at 3200 on the SL2 because this is an SL2S. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to go to 12,500, and I could probably go higher than that. This yeah, camera, I'm 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 a little bit bolder than you. I'm at 64. I'm at 64 for the SL2. Okay. Uh, because again, this is the maximum ISO. It doesn't mean you're going to be here all the time. Yep. Um, and then I'm at 25 for the SL2S. Oh wow. Okay. 25,000. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm just being a little more conservative here as a landscape photographer. Yeah. Uh, shutter speed limit. No, I do not trust auto. Auto is the devil. Okay. We don't do <laughs> auto. And there's another set. There's a lot of settings in here. You'll notice these are specific shutter speeds. Uh, they've actually changed this over time. So it, they've, in some models, like on the M, there's actually a one over F, uh, one over two times F. It's like a math problem. Uh, it's like one over three parentheses F. And you're like, what? No, I don't want to do math. I just want to do photography. So auto is basically doing that. It's taking the focal length that you're shooting at and figuring out what the slowest speed is, and it's usually wrong. So I will just by default set this to 250th. Mm. I've got really effective image stabilization on the camera. I can get away with a 250th of a second with any lens, including up to the 90 to 280. If I know I'm going to be shooting something a little faster moving, I'm definitely just going to bump this up to 500th. Mm. If I know that I'm shooting very static subjects, like mountains, and I'm standing still, and the subject's standing still, and I'm shooting with shorter focal length lenses, like 1635, then I'll probably drop this down to 125. So this is, you know, I know a lot of people, well, what's the right one setting? The one <laughs> right setting? It's like, well, it depends, right? Yeah, we have a whole show called It Depends. But I'm working generally in that range. 125th for somewhat stationary subjects, 250 for just general use, and 500th when I know I'm going to be operating mostly with telephoto or with things that are moving faster, like birds or whatever. Um, so I'm going to use, use that. And then uh, Max ISO with flash, I'm going to skip because I never use the yeah, camera with ne flash. Neither of us use flash, so... And shutter speed limit with flash, I'm not setting. Yeah. So just basically, the only thing you really need to be concerned with is maximum ISO and shutter speed limit. These two settings here are going to dictate that. So what's happening? I'm going to describe this. If I'm in aperture priority, I am setting my aperture, which is controlling my depth of field. Mm -hmm. 
which is also influencing the shutter speed and ISO combination I can get. If I'm shooting at f11, I know I'm not, I'm going to have to give up shutter speed uh, and or ISO in combination, because unless I have just gobs and gobs of light. But in a normal circumstance, there's this balancing act between your three pillars of the exposure. ISO, which is how sensitive it is, f-stop, which is how much light is coming through an opening in the lens, and shutter speed, how long it's actually exposing for. These are all related to each other. This is in the lesson on photography, just, just a refresher here. So what the camera is going to do with these settings is it's going to try to maintain, let's say, 1 25th of a second at the ISO that you have set, or not the ISO, rather, it's setting the ISO. Uh, it's going to change the ISO to maintain that shutter speed at that given aperture in the given light level, which means I'm generally, let's say, aperture priority. If I'm shooting f4 at 1 25th of a second, it's going to just float the ISO for me as the light conditions change, but my exposure variables, shutter speed and aperture, are going to be very consistent from shot to shot to shot. Hopefully that makes sense. If I was shooting manually, and here's why I call it assisted manual. If I was shooting in pure manual, what I would be doing is, let's say setting it to F4 at 125th, but oh my, oh, it's dark. Okay, I need to go into ISO and I need to bump ISO. Oh, it's bright. I need to go into ISO and bump it down. Well, why should I bother with that if the camera can do it faster for me and I don't have to worry about it? I can focus on just shooting, knowing that I have a fast enough shutter speed, I have the aperture that I want, and I'm focused on focusing, framing, and timing. Auto ISO is a very, very handy tool, unless you are on a tripod, and then it's going to mess up royally. <laughs> yes. So make sure, and that's, again, why we have it set on a, on a custom function here, uh, right up here. By default, you don't even have to set this one. By default, the right custom function button is ISO. And I'm going to jump between auto for walk around shooting and then shooting, let's say, at 100 or 200 when I'm on a tripod. And then, you know, it's a, it's a little more uh, controlled environment than when you're shooting handheld and you're jumping between lighting conditions. Yeah, I can't think of a scenario where I would be in auto ISO on a tripod, at least not off the top of my head. I because can, I can the main reason you're using auto ISO is so you can keep a handholdable shutter speed. But of course, a tripod eliminates that as a variable because you can shoot whatever speed you want. Sweet. Good. All right. Good job. Uh, we are finally on the second page of the SL2 menu after an hour and 13 minutes of talking. Well, I think those oh, are the important ones. No, it's all important. No, you're right. None of it's important. Just put it on full auto. Um, okay. Page two. Quickly skimming through the things that are blah, blah. Floating ISO, this is for variable aperture zoom lenses. So let's say you have a 24 to 90, which is a 28 to 4. This makes sure that it's compensating for the fact that as you zoom the lens, even though you're not actually changing anything, if you're at maximum aperture, like 28, 24, the aperture is stopping down, even though you're not actually stopping it down. So it was just compensating for that. Just leave it on. I always leave it on. White balance, we shoot DNG. White balance, we can change later. The only time that I'm going to use anything other than white balance auto for stills is if I'm shooting in the studio with continuous controlled lighting. I'll do a flash exposure, um, like a gray card uh, setting. But other than that, I'm in auto. We vary on this. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did, you didn't used to be this way. I know. I changed. Oh, look at this man evolving. Well, oh, why so, don't here, and then why you, do you pick over to David and he need job? I use that. I set it to daylight. And mm. I found this especially useful, for instance, I was showing you pictures from Greenland in daylight, and you notice they were pretty blue. If I, and, and this was a conversation I was having with other people on the trip, because most people were shooting in auto, mm -hmm. and they looked at my pictures and they're why are your pictures so blue? I said, because it's blue out. You just don't know it because we've been sailing around on a boat at two in the morning for the last few hours, and our eyes have adjusted to how blue the light is. So our eyes, kind of act like auto ISO, auto auto white balance. If you're staring, you know, let's say the, the classic example is if you put on red tinted glasses, rose tinted glasses, your brain will adjust and you won't see that tint anymore after a while. You take the glasses off and then everything looks blue because it's your brain has acclimated to the red and then suddenly you've removed it and now everything's blue again. Auto 
white balance, like your eyes, is going to try to normalize and make everything relatively neutral. If you're going to a place, let's say you're shooting sunrise, you're shooting sunset, you're shooting dawn and dusk, those are very colorful times. So for landscape applications, if you want to actually see the color that's in the scene without your eyes tricking you, I really like using daylight balance. So we should bring color temperature meters with us. No, I'm I just, get, I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna bring it. I'm gonna bring it. I used to have a color temperature meter. I know. So don't I? I'm an I don't know where it went. I had this conic something. Nice. Very expensive. They're like they were like. I know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so I use daylight balance because it, it's sort of it's always this point of truth. I know that the camera's well, always if you're shooting in the daylight. No, even if you're shooting Jeez. if you're shooting in the blue hour. Wow, look at this. Man. If you're shooting in the blue hour, Bold. It's going to look blue. Okay. Not gray. That's why I've, I've shifted to using daylight balance. I love it. All right. Uh, it also means I have to do a lot less editing because mm. think about this. In in the film days, I would shoot daylight balanced film mm -hmm. for sunsets and for night photography. As long as I wasn't okay. shooting under tungsten lighting, the daylight balanced film worked fantastic for landscape applications. That being said, if I'm shooting, because I kind of hit on that tungsten point, yeah. if you're shooting night photography, mm -hmm. walk around, let's say street photography by city lights. Yeah, I'm going to go to auto because the changing lighting conditions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with artificial lighting, it will wreak havoc on a daylight balance. Um, I never use cloudy or shadow because I find them to be really, really yellow and murky. And I don't really use tungsten for shooting in, um, in those mixed lighting scenarios. I use auto. Now, I will say there's an, there's one more exception with which I'm sure uh, these guys in Iceland just found out. So I know Albert's watching, but here I, or, uh, I gotta look down for a second. So for Northern Lights, there's a very specific thing. I shoot uh, here, 3,900 degrees Kelvin. And it's for the same reason. Auto white balance is gonna turn everything murky if you shoot in, let's say, 3,900 or 4,000 Kelvin, you're actually going to get green aurora and blue skies. So that's the, all right. I like it. I three like the three settings. Good tips. Let's keep going. <laughs> Just go, we, go, go. We got to cover stuff. Um, come back to me. There we go. Thank you. Next, uh, we have photo file format. Uh, David and I shoot, of course, in DNG only. So this is right away there. Um, JPEG settings, the only thing I'm going to talk about in here, this is how you would have um, black and white live view. If you wanted to see that, you go to your film style, and we go to one of the monochrome settings, and now it's black and white. Otherwise, since we don't shoot JPEG, it's not something that we mess around with. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just laughed because what? someone wrote, David, what is your white balance setting for Q2 mono? Ah. <laughs> uh, grayscale. It is, yeah. There is the white balance. Um, Auto review, this changes based on what I'm shooting. I generally keep it off because I don't necessarily want to be forced to look at the image I just took all the time. Sometimes it'll throw off my rhythm. Um, if I'm on a tripod shooting landscape, I may keep it on. What do you like to use for that, for auto review? Uh, on auto review, eh, one second, three second, I'll usually bump around because I, I do like to see the results that I'm getting as I'm shooting, especially under tricky lighting. And the, and the reality is, if here, if I'm shooting and I have a three second delay set up here and I photograph something. You're not gonna be able to shoot anything right there. You're not gonna be able you're to. You're an IAF. I am, right? Oh yeah, why am I an IAF? This is horrible. There we go. Let me go to MF, okay. So if I'm shooting. <laughs> ah! <laughs> That's Terrible. Take that out. Uh, welcome to Red Dot Pro Camera Talk, where we are prepared and on top of it. <laughs> but if I do this, all I have to do is is half press the shutter, and the review goes away. Yeah, I, I always have it off. My battery is also dying, but I have a spare. Hang on. Here, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back to JPEG settings for just one second. Okay. While you go back, um, I agree. If you go to film style and you go to monochrome, you can do your black and white live view. But something that was introduced in the in not the the last major firmware yeah, two release, updates ago. two updates ago, is this IDR, which is intelligent intelligent dynamic range, and it shooting in JPEG or not in JPEG in DNG only like we do, you might think that these JPEG settings have no relevance, 
But if I use the IDR and set it to high, it actually will show the uh, preview in the viewfinder, bringing up the shadows and bringing the highlights down a little bit. So it will give you a, a more realistic result for a post-processed image than just shooting in, you know, in off. Okay. So there's there's actually some value there, and I'm still experimenting to see if it's worthwhile or not. It's not affecting the image whatsoever. It's just the preview that's showing in the viewfinder. Well said. Very okay. nice. So where were you at? Now we are done with auto review, long exposure noise reduction, which um, is something people have no, thank you. people have always asked about being able to turn off. This is basically after a long exposure, the camera takes another exposure of equal length with the shutter closed or turned off so that it can subtract any long exposure noise from your image. This does double the amount of time it does take to do long exposures. I always keep it on anyway because I'd rather have less noise. I'm assuming you do the same. I leave mine uh, set to on as well. Yeah. And if you want to shoot faster when you're doing long exposures, you just buy a second camera and you alternate the two of them. Problem solved. <laughs> I like it. Next, we have shutter type. This one I leave is, in default. Uh, yeah. I leave in hybrid. This is essentially just whether you want mechanical shutter only, electronic shutter only, which you would do if you're trying to shoot completely silently, or hybrid, which is where the camera will only use electronic shutter when the mechanical shutter speed is exceeded for a correct exposure. So if you need to go to a 25,000th of a second for shooting a Noctilux wide open on the beach in hybrid mode, the camera will roll over and it'll throw you off at first because you won't hear anything when you take a photo, but you'll see it quickly freeze for a second as it takes the picture. That's the electronic shutter in action. So hybrid is simple for that. Now, I think Jose can chime in on this one. Can he? Please. Jose? Jose. Yes. I thought about you because you probably use electronic shutter only more than we do. Yeah, in certain occasions that requires complete, you know, discretion and to be completely quiet yeah definitely because well, you feel like in a music video set or something right? yeah yeah anything that's filming that has to be completely quiet any any type of set yeah that's that comes in very yeah. handy for sure yeah. i mean or let's say you're you know even casually shooting at a wedding oh yeah you don't want to be the guy with click 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 yeah. click no everyone's going to be like scowling at you yeah but if you're taking electronic shutter it'll be completely silent and nobody will know anything, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're in a church and anything that requires you to be completely silent, because yeah. when it's dead quiet like that, you will hear the, the mechanical shutter. Yeah, the <laughs> thunder. Oh, oh my God. Bit, it's, <laughs> yeah. So. And it, you will be the subject of much ire. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. yes. All right. Yeah, so. on a film set, it, I mean, the audio is very sensitive. So it's, it's crazy. Like, okay, cool. Nice. All right. Carrying on here. Uh, we're going to skip flash settings because we don't shoot the flash, so we're not even going to bother. Like I said, we're not going to cover everything. Um, live view settings. Oh, you got to talk about this. This one I got to talk about. So there's two things here that are relevant. Exposure preview. This has two options, PAS or PASM. What essentially this is doing is previewing the manual exposure while when you have pressed the shutter. So if you're shooting in a studio, with flashes and your exposure that you've set is way, way, way darker than the actual room lighting, you don't want to have PASM because every time you try to half press the shutter, it's going to look totally dark. So for artificial lighting, you when you're adding your augmenting the light yourself, put it on PAS, everything else, PASM. This is easy to experiment with. You can just try that. Um, but I, I want to really talk about the next one. Enhanced live view sounds good, right? Who doesn't like things that are enhanced? Isn't that new. Yeah, enhanced yeah. sounds great. Wow. This is a feature like added in firmware, and it's supposed to provide additional gain if you're in a super, super low light situation. I don't know. I haven't really seen much of a benefit practically, but the challenge is if you turn this on, it eliminates focus peaking. So if you are someone who uses focus peaking a lot and you say, oh, I want things to be enhanced, I'll turn on enhanced live view, you're going to lose your focus peaking. <laughs> So I hear people often will say, I can't figure out how to get peaking turned on. I have it set. I have all the things turned on. I say, well, do you have an enhanced live view turn on? They say, yes, of course. So I say, turn it off. So you generally want to keep this setting off. I have not personally yet found a situation where I need to turn it on, but I haven't tried it enough, I guess. All I know is it gets in my way. So I just so that's in live view settings, enhanced live view off. And that is default. 
Yes, don't yeah. turn it on. Um, sensor format, this is, if you have a TL lens attached, this will be stuck on APS-C. If you have a full frame lens attached, you could choose. I don't really see the reason to purposely crop all, you could crop later, unless you have. So I believe actually when you're shooting in APS mode, that it still takes the full resolution DNG. It just, yeah, it just it's puts like, yeah, metadata it's like, cropping. Yeah. Uh, so it can be good for visualization, especially if you're shooting, say, a small bird or something in the distance, and you want to get in a little closer, uh, and you know that you're going to be cropping somewhat after the fact, this will at least make the live view larger so you can see the smaller subject but it's not going to take away any of your total picture information. Yeah, I'm just playing with it, yeah. It yeah. does It does make, yeah, so it's in, it's real-time cropping and, and, and playback is also cropped. So to basically, think about it like magnified live view. Because yeah. that, that, that'll that help you if you if you need it. All right, next Skip we've it. got <laughs> photo. This is, well, if you're Skip shooting it. for a specific ratio, yeah. like in the old days when you had to shoot in a square for Instagram, you could just oh. this will change. Um, what the live view looks like. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess if you're, if you're shooting for a specific print size, fine. Uh, why don't you talk about the next one, David? Storage options. Okay. So storage options here by default, you see SD plus SD one plus SD two. There is, if you don't know this, there is two SD card slots in an SL two and an SL two S. SD one is the top one. SD two is the bottom one. The default behavior, as you see here, standard, is to put a DNG plus JPEG on SD1 plus SD2. That means that it's going to basically fill up your first card, and then it's going to fill up your second card when the first card is full and there's no more space on it. It'll also prompt you with a really annoying message every time you turn the camera on that SD1 is full before defaulting to SD2. So just safety tip here or Pro tip, just pull the card out so you don't get that message every single time. Now, if you are taking the trip of a lifetime or shooting a once in a lifetime event like a wedding where you can't repeat it, you can't go back, you may want to look into the top option, which is backup. And that's going to be SD1 equals SD2. So it's going to put exactly the same information on both cards simultaneously. So if one of these cards fails, you have exactly the same information on the other card. That's not a bad deal, especially when you have cards like this, which is a 256 gigabyte card. You have a lot of space on these and you can back these up if you want to, because it's a lot of eggs, proverbial eggs in one basket. The last option here is to split uh, DNG raw files on the first card, and put JPEGs on the second card. I don't even know what this is because I never shoot JPEGs on the camera. I don't think Josh does either, so I've never used that. I generally use standard because I am taking my cards out of the camera every single night and downloading them into Lightroom before putting the card back into the camera and then shooting more the next day, backing those photos up. So I'm backing up as I go. I'm never just leaving this in till I get home you know, thousands of pictures later right. and, you know, rolling the dice. And he's talking about that before if you've seen yeah. some of our other shows. But I will say, yes. if I was in a place that was so utterly remote right. and disconnected from power, and let, let's say I was doing a Kirsten thing and I was on an overland multi-day hike where I don't have a laptop, I don't have a power source, but I have a few extra batteries on the camera or a solar charger or something like that just for the camera, then you know what? I probably would take along two 256 gig cards and do a backup mm. just in case. Yeah. And and that would be when I would use that. Or like I said, let's say I was shooting a family member's wedding or something, or I, I, an, an event you can't do again. That would be uh, That would be my suggestion there. All right, let's go. I think uh, your... Hmm? I think we need to do a quick uh, battery die. Something. Yep. Not just no, the one in the camera. No, my battery. That's yours. Oh, my battery. I just popped nope. a new one in there. No, nope, the one over your head. The one over my head. Yeah. Wait, I think like it was plugged in. I don't know. Why don't we go to the computer? <laughs> and and you, uh, can, talk about, you can talk about something special, Josh. What am I talking about? 
Do you want to talk about anything on here? Oh, I see. What did or you actually talk about here? You can tell them about the trip again. Well, we did have something to to show today. What do we have something? Well, to show? Dave was going to show that, so that's your thing. It's your, I am. your turn for show and tell today. I am. Just yeah. change the battery. It's fine. There we go. I'll, I'll I'll operate your camera. Well, here. I just want. Why don't you just show them? If you can do that real quick. How am I showing them that? Yeah. So that I can do something else. Is Jose giving us a battery? Yes. Thank you, Jose. Oh. oh. <laughs> that didn't happen. It never happened. <laughs> David, you just, you just stand on my chair? I do. Just... No, I'm going to stand on my chair. Okay. So you're going to look at this and tell them about this one more time. Switch over to me, Jose. There we go. All right. So uh, while David changes the battery, like I said, we're still experimenting with the overhead setup. Let's hope he doesn't fall over and, and you don't see him standing on the chair right now. But um, anyway, uh, we do have one spot left for our Moab astrophotography workshop in September with Colin leading that. Um, you'll be able to do photos like the ones you see here. We get questions all the time about astrophotography and long exposure stuff. This will be your chance to learn how to do it and take cool astrophotography photos. Did you do it already? Yeah, I did it. Oh, it happened. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Cool beans. Jose. Switch to my camera, please. That was pretty smooth. Nobody died. Everything's great. <laughs> right. And no, not yet. Happened. Now oh, I we need, are I need a battery here though. We are <laughs> You want to take, take one of them? No, I'll take one, one of these here. No, take oh. this one. We're doing great. This is great. Thank it's you. Professional. <laughs> All right. There we go. We are finally ready to go to the fourth page of six. So we are going to try to get through as much as we can. The first item on page four is called customized control. I actually don't really do much in this menu. I don't have any favorites turned on because I just find that annoying. Um, the favorites menu is what would come up in between the quick um, icons and the main menu. I don't change the function of the joystick, and I don't change the wheels. I guess if you're used to the wheels going a certain way, which happens to be the opposite way, they're from the factory, you can change the direction. This is actually a menu that I never go into. I'm going to guess, David, you never go into either. I do not. So we're going to go on. We're going to move on. Image overlay. This is a feature that was added in firmware. And what this allows you to do is take a picture that's on the memory card already and have it sort of half opacity uh, or you can choose the transparency here, um, overlaid over the live view. So if you're shooting something that has to be uh, repeated to a certain format, let's say for me, if I'm photographing some you know, of our used inventory and I want all the M cameras to be in the exact same spot of the frame, um, or if you're doing a photo of a certain scene over the of course of time and you're going back to that location, you can have the photos that you took before and you can have it overlaid so you can frame it up exactly the same way. So. I'm not saying a lot of people would use this feature. It is cool that it exists. I like that like it did something kind of funky like that. So anyway, that's overlay. Um, I think you need to come back to this. Let, let's get through just the, the remaining few and then, oh, yeah, then yeah. we'll uh, do the last. We're going to hold off the user profile for right now. Uh, dial lock no, just locks no all the dials on the camera, which I never use. Joystick lock, stupidest no. thing ever. You would think <laughs> it would lock just up, down, left, right, so you can keep your point in the center. But no, it also locks the press, so you can't activate the focus in manual focus mode. Super dumb. Um, display settings. This is a, not a menu I ever go into. I don't guess need to go if in you there. wanted to adjust the color of the screen, I don't. I don't change any of this. You can also adjust it to, to 120 frames per second EVF, but I don't notice much. Right. Of I don't really see much of it. I think it just consumes more power. It does. Um, it does. So you want to do user profiles, or you want to? Uh, no, keep going. Keep, keep going. going. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like a photos, we are going to do an episode dedicated to photos. This is where you have Wi-Fi, so Airing we're not going to cover it now. Yeah, go we'll back. eventually do an episode. Um, Image yeah, these, these are quick ones. So stabilization, straightforward. We pretty much have it on all the time, except when we are tripod mounted, then we turn it off. And I'll show that. So I like to set, on, on my camera, I like to set uh, image stabilization to, you can't see it, but there's two buttons on the front of the camera, right? And I'm going to set it to the top one. Well, no, sorry. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, actually, no, the bottom one. So the bottom one, by default, is autofocus mode. I could care less. So I'm going to set that to do, 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 do. Where is it? Image stabilization. Because just like I'm changing drive mode when I'm going on and off the tripod. So let's say I'm going to go on a tripod. I'm, I'm handheld right now. I'm going to put it on a tripod. Well, I'm going to switch it from single to self-timer, and then I'm going to tap the front, and I'm going to turn image stabilization off. Bomb. 
and I'm ready to shoot on a tripod. Just with custom function here, custom function on the front, not a lot of monkeying around. Mm -hmm. There's even a faster way to do that that Josh is going to show you in a second or a few well, minutes. We're almost there. But we're almost there. Yeah. So image stabilization, there is no reason not to leave this on all the time unless you're shooting on a tripod. Yeah. Um, and this, the panning mode is part of image yeah, stabilization. Yeah, panning mode basically here, this is if you're um, panning a shot sideways like that or like this, something's moving, for example, it will not try to stabilize the panning. So it's basically sensing the fact that you're moving the camera and not trying to counteract that. It's only stabilizing you in the direction that you're not actually moving the camera in. So that is what auto panning is. Um, format card, self-explanatory. This will format the memory card. This is what you'll want to do before you update firmware before you go out and shoot again with a card that you've already uploaded and backed up. Uh, very straightforward. Camera settings, we'll get to in a second. Um, camera information, this is where you will view and update your camera firmware. Pretty easy. I don't do anything else in here. I guess if you want to see the copyright information. I think the regulatory information is fascinating. This is where you could put your name <laughs> in the metadata if you want to go to the copyright information. I don't do that because I'm constantly switching between stored demo cameras, but if you wanted to have on your camera your name stored in the file information, you could turn on the copyright information and put in a um, two different fields worth of information, maybe your name or your website or who knows. Um, Artist. Uh, language, obviously language is where you pick your language and reset we did at there the beginning is. of the show. So now so go back to camera settings. I'm going to go through camera settings for a moment and then we will do user profiles and that will finish off the and, show. And to answer uh, to answer Scott's question, why not do a user profile for tripod? Well, we're getting there, yeah. That's exactly what we're getting to. So Hold, don't ask about user us. profiles, we haven't covered it yet. <laughs> bear, bear with us. Uh, all right, so now we're into camera settings here. First one we have is capture assistance. This is where we're going to choose how many of our four, up to four different display modes we have and what we're going to see in each of those display modes. So the first part of the screen, you're cutting these on or off, whether you want to have one, two, three, or four different display modes um, that you can choose from. And then under setting, you get to decide inside of those four different display modes how many things that you are seeing. So this is sort of self-explanatory. If you know you want to have one mode that has nothing, you could turn all of these off. If you want another mode that maybe has your grid and your level gauge, et cetera, et cetera. And just quickly to show the cycle through your different info profiles, the default behavior for that is the FN button on the back. You can see since I have all four activated, oops, I can cycle through the four info profiles that way. Pretty straightforward. Again, totally customizable. I personally like to have one with the bars and one clear, and that's pretty much it. Although you you kind of nailed on what what I like, yeah, which is uh, especially for landscape shooting, I love mm. the six by four grid. Okay, uh, let me just go to here. So I will generally have one that has the uh, that doesn't have info bars. Oh, let's change that. That doesn't have info bars. That does have a six by four grid. That does have clipping. If I can set it, here we go. Yes. Why is it off? You're good. No, nope, it's off. Oh, there we go. Uh, that does have clipping, so that's setting it at 253 as a as a white point. Uh, that has focus peaking definitely turned off. I actually have that disabled on all of my info displays, mm -hmm. and also has a level gauge. So that's going to be sort of my main landscape looking thing because I want to make sure that my horizons are level. I'm using that grid as a compositional aid, especially with uh, lining subjects up. And then I always want to see if my highlights are going to be blown out or not. So having that um, the clipping information here as visible, it's not by default. I, I do like to turn that on. And then similar to, to Josh, I like one that's clean, that has nothing in it at all except full view. I like to have another one with the bars. And the bars, the info bars, so this is a clean display. The info bars are is this top and bottom section here. Switch to me I know, I just switch. <laughs> but what's interesting is if I turn that off, you'll notice that there's image information underneath those bars. A lot of people think that when you have that on, that's the image. The image actually extends higher and lower. So for composition, it's not great because there's a little bit of transparency here, but you're not accurately framing your your subject because 
you're not seeing the whole frame. So I like to have that information to see what my shutter speed is, aperture, ISO, exposure compensation, how many frames remaining, all that stuff. But then, and, and I like to have this view, well, actually not that view, this view, which is giving me a full compositional view, plus a level gauge that I can make sure my horizon is level and that, and if I go here, you'll see, okay, that is the clipping. So that means that that is being blown out and I wanna make sure that my exposure compensation is dialed back to where I'm not clipping any information. Uh, some people ask me why I don't have a histogram on here as well. I find the histogram is a little too small, a little too inaccurate, and a little too distracting. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm not blowing out highlights, I know that my histogram looks okay. That's basically it. I'm visually looking at this, and as long as I don't have anything clipped, I'm good to go. And then I do like a full clear view that I'll use after everything's leveled out and my composition's good, and I know I'm not clipping anything, but I'm just basically waiting for the, the perfect moment because now I have an unobstructed viewfinder image to everything. All right. So there, these are, I think, worth your time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, to make sure that you set these up. And if you only use, let's say, three of them, you can just turn the fourth off and just say, I have a full view, I have a, um, an info view, and then I have my compositional view. So that's the way I would set mine up. Sweet. Okay, now. We got a few more settings to cover here. Yep, T cover the other ones and then yep, we'll and move we'll, on. Then we'll to get to the, the good stuff. Yes. Um, touch AF, that's simply you tap on the screen and it will focus under your finger. Touch AF and EVF is where if you hold the camera up to your eye, you can tap on the screen. I turn both of these off. I don't like accidentally touching the screen and something happening, so. Yeah, my recommendation. Uh, macro focus limits, not engaged because we don't have a macro lens attached. AF assist lamp. I pretty much leave this on unless I need to be super, super discreet in a low light situation and don't want the assist lamp illuminating anything. Um, power saving. This is just your personal preference. How long the camera turns on. Uh, is this can be undisturbed before it powers itself off. Uh, oops. USB charging, we turn on. Acoustic signal is the beeps, which we turn off. Lens profiles, this one's important because if you have a non six bit coded lens or non six bit coded adapter, well, this, this, this is all coded, mm. um, you need to manually assign a lens profile if you want to be able to use image stabilization. Um, these are all six bit coded, unfortunately. So if you were to attach, like here's an M adapter L, but this is um, with a six bit coded lens, so not a good example. If you were to attach a non six bit lens, you would need to manually choose your lens profile so that you have image stabilization and auto ISO because part of auto ISO is the camera needs to know the focal length. Um, so, or I would say, sorry, auto ISO and then auto Mac, um, slowest shutter speed if you wanted that, which we don't even use. We don't use that. Anyway, so just be sure if you have a non six bit coded lens that you're going into your camera settings menu, you're going to the second page, you're finding lens profiles and you're assigning a lens profile. Um, if you'll see, if I'll put for the sake of, screw this up. Here we go. Oh, now you did it. Put an M lens on here, so you could see. Trying to do this. Trying to do this blind is easier said than done. Oh, don't. Okay. <laughs> You're giving up. <laughs> How much time am I going to spend on this? There you go. Now you can see it detects that there's a an, a lens that's six bit coded, which I've now assigned it. If I go to camera settings, I'm still good. Yeah, I'm good. No, wait, there's like a bar. Where did that reflection come from? Away. <laughs> it wasn't her. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we go to lens profiles. Here, you can see the camera is automatically assigning my profile, but I can also go in and change it to any M lens that I so desire. In this case, I wouldn't because it's the correct lens. It's six bit coded. But again, if you have a non coded lens, this is where you would choose it. If I just like angle it slightly. No. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what changed. I think the lens was heavier. Ah, yeah. There we go. I guess yeah, it. There Fine. you go. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, EV increment. I don't know why you would want half stops, not full stops, but or third stops. So fine. USB mode and PTP. If you're plugging in, we're not getting into that. Distance unit meters. Even in the states, we like meters. And this is where you'll set your date and time. 
Pixel mapping is if you see any dead pixels, you can use that to remap the pixels on the sensor and eliminate them. These are all minor things we really want to get to and finish off with oh, yeah. user profiles. Now, in my opinion, user profiles are the most underutilized feature on these cameras. The way that, and I've made this analogy on the show before, but I'll make it again. The way that I talk about user profiles or the analogy I use is imagine you have your car with power seats and you can adjust the headrest and the bolsters and the lumbar and the thigh and all your 25 different adjustments. And every time somebody else gets in your car, whether it's your partner or one of your kids or one of your friends, and they drive it, well, they're going to go in and they're going to change all your settings. What do you do to get back to your settings? Well, you have your memory seats. So you maybe you have two memory seat or two, you know, two buttons or four buttons, and you simply press that button and the seat goes back just the way you like it. Think of user profiles as your memory seats for the camera. You have a particular configuration of settings that you save as a user profile. So anytime you activate that profile, all of those settings are automatically populated in the menu. Now, a lot of people feel like for a user profile, they have to have a million different changes and it has to be super customized. Not at all. Simply, from my, in my mind, anything more than one setting change in my mind could be enough to justify a user profile, especially if those two particular settings aren't near each other in the menu. Let's say one of them is lens profiles and one of them is stabilization or one of them is, or whatever, where it would take me a lot of time to go diving into the menu and, and change those settings. I will create a user profile with those settings already configured. Now, in the older days, what we always had to do was make sure that one of our function buttons was assigned to user profile so that every time we went into a different profile, we could quickly bounce between them with that function button, kind of a pain. What I love now about the sort of modern Leica interface is right over here on the quick menu, you actually have a dedicated icon right here, the little person for user profiles. So instead of having to remember to set a function button in, inside of every profile to be for user profile, so you could always have access to them quickly, you can use the user profile button in the quick menu to quickly bounce between your profiles. Now, again, you don't have to have 25 different changes. You can simply have a couple of changes. So um, I say, why don't you go through, like you make one sure. in real time for us, and I'll make one in real time. And okay. then we'll, that's how we'll, we'll sort of end the show. Tell us what you're gonna do and then show us, please. Okay. So let's make a, a tripod one, there a we landscape go. tripod. I like it. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go through, and I'm going to set this to drive mode, self-timer, two seconds, focusing. I'm going to take it to manual focus, autofocus mode of field, and I'm going to go a step further than that. And I'm going to make sure that this field is the, let's say the, oh, I keep doing that, uh, the small field. Okay, small field. Let's go back in the menu. Exposure metering. We're going to make sure it's highlight weighted. Uh, exposure compensation. Let's just by default, let's go to minus one. There we go. Yeah. Uh, not auto ISO. Let's go to 100 because ISO 50 on, actually, well, ISO 50, I think, is a pull. It's a pull, yeah. yeah. We don't want to use that. And we're going to turn white balance to daylight, as as we discussed. And photo formats, DNG. And David's going fast, but the whole point is this is recorded. So don't feel like you have to write this all down because you'll be able to right. watch this later. But we covered all these settings. So yeah. I'm just going to yeah, go Yeah, I know, through. but I'm just reminding me. I'm like, <laughs> this is yeah. going to be recorded. So auto, auto review, three seconds. Long exposure, noise reduction on. Uh, shutter type hybrid is fine. And sensor format's fine, storage option, okay. So all of this is gonna be fine. And now we're gonna go, and, and I could I could go further and say like customize control. I'm just not gonna do it for the sake of speed. Yeah. Or do you want me to actually show that? Uh, I think you should show it. I okay. think if we go a bit over, I think it's okay, because this is okay. important. Okay, so we're gonna go, uh, whoop, not there, actually. In the wrong spot. Uh, not that, it's gonna be in. Where is it? You think of camera settings. Oh, camera settings. Yeah. Okay. Well, stabilization you want to turn off. Stabilization right? is off. Yeah. Camera settings. Uh, so here we're going to go to capture assistance and I'm going to turn off number three, number four. I'm going to go into info one and this is going to be everything off. Okay. We're going to go back there. Number two, I'm going to use that as my 
uh, no info bars, but I am going to do my 6x4 grid. I'm going to make sure I have my clipping set to 253. I'm going to make sure focus peaking is off. I'm going to turn level gauge on. Histogram still going to be off. Profile 3, I'm going to set up with info bars. No grid. I'll still leave clipping on. I will turn focus peaking off. Uh, let's say level gauge is on. And I'm going to turn histogram off. Nothing for 4. And we're going to go back. Uh, touch AF, I'm going to leave on because sometimes I actually do like to touch mm -hmm. the screen mm -hmm. when I'm on a tripod. And we do not want an autofocus lamp on because it's going to make people very mad when I get red <laughs> lights in their long exposures. Power saving, we're going to actually turn auto power, uh, auto off to off because we're going to be hanging around on a tripod for a long time. And I'll turn my displays off after five minutes. USB charging is on because sometimes I do charge it in the field. And that is all good. Okay, so now we're going to go back out of here up to, where is user profiles? So I'm going to go to user profiles. Okay, go slower here because we haven't covered okay, this yet. Okay, now I'm going to scroll down. Notice these are all grayed out. So I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom to manage profiles. And I'm going to save as profile. And we're going to put it in user one, which is unused. Save as user one, yes. And now I'm going, no. And now I'm going to go back and I'm going to rename the profile in the previous screen. And we're going to rename user one to, let's go back here. And I'm going to call it landscape. We're going to try to call it landscape. There you go. Okay, landscape. Ooh. Okay, nice. now I have a landscape user profile. And I could then change all these settings because I can use this as a base, right? So all I have to do at that point, after you've customized this, let's say the only thing that I'm really doing differently now is I'm going to go drive mode back to single. Uh, focusing, I'm still going to keep that same focus mode, except instead of the small box, I'm going to make it the medium size focus field. Let's go back in here. Exposure metering, I still like that, but compensation, I'm going to put it at zero. My ISO, I'm going to put it auto. We make sure our auto ISO settings are the way we like them. So let's say 3200. And for general shooting, I'm going to be at 250th. Go back. Loading ISO. White balance, I'm going to put it auto. Photo file format's fine. Auto review, I'm going to just put it off. And all this should be good still because I'm not really changing anything else, right? Except for image stabilization, which did I get to yet? Nope. I want image stabilization on. And now I'm going to go in, going to go back to user profiles. And now I'm going to go back here to manage profiles, save as profile, user two. Yes, I want to save it. Now I'm going to go back. I'm going to rename that user2 to handheld. OK, now I have the ability. Let's go back to this screen. I have the ability to easily go. I've got my default profile, which factory, factory, defaults. factory defaults. Mm -hmm. I've got landscape, and I've got handheld. And I can just easily switch back and forth. And it gives me all those same settings. And I can easily switch back and forth uh, between these, which is really, really cool. And you've now simplified where you don't have to dig through menus to, to do all this. I could also change, I didn't do it, but I could change the assignments of custom functions on the camera as well. Yeah, that's one thing we didn't spend a lot of time on just because we only have two hours. Um, mm -hmm. But the custom function button assignments are also stored in user profiles. They are, yeah. Yeah, these are- You want to you come back. Yeah, these are hugely valuable. Um, I You want me to do one real quick? Yeah, 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 Josh, you, you um, create one. So I will do one for my um, car photography. I actually tend to do two. I have. I'll only set up one, but I have one for what I call static cars and one for moving cars because that's kind of 
those settings are going to be different. Let me just fix my camera here. So this one will be, uh, the one I'll set up will be for my car photography, uh, which is static. So drive mode is going to be single. For me, focusing MF, of course, I do tend to use spot more than anything else. Um, I actually turn off auto magnification. I just get to my way. Um, standard, I change to 360, which I like. Uh, metering, I like the multi-field uh, compensation. I usually do minus two thirds. Auto ISO is great. For me, because I want to be a little bit on the safe side, I tend to do a 500th because I'm shooting during the day anyway. So I have tons of light. I'm not worried about the camera getting too high for ISO. I'm shooting DNG only. Auto review, I always turn off. That's on. Live view settings, good. Good, good, good. Customize control, we don't touch. Off, we don't touch that one. Stabilization's on. Capture assistance, I actually, for, for my car stuff, I only have one profile in use, which is the, the all off profile. I turn all the other ones off because I just, for me, for that, I'm not even really looking at the screen that much or, or looking at information. I'm just you know, I'm using my polarizer, focusing on super precise composition. So I want nothing in the way. Um, I turn off all the touchscreen stuff. I don't mind the AF type being on. I'm not even, it's, you know, I haven't, you know, it's daytime. Uh, 10 minutes and five minutes. And this is all gonna be the same. So now I've got my car photography set up pretty much dialed in. So I go to user profile. I'm just gonna go up. It takes me to the bottom. It's a shortcut. Manage profiles. Save as profile. Save as user one. I'll rename user one. Do, 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 do. And then we'll call this cars. I guess I could use the touch screen. It's so much faster. And then static. Did I hit the limit? Oh, hit the character limit. I think I usually do with no space. That's why. can't type. How did you do it so smoothly? There we go. <laughs> okay. so now I have, I'm only going to make one for time. But basically, now, anytime that I want to get the camera going, I just simply go to my little guy here, and I go to car static, and boom. And what's cool is, when I, whenever I do this on my own time, and I have my cars moving set up as well, if I'm shooting some cars, and one of them starts to roll, or somebody's coming in that looks really cool, I'll bounce over to my moving profile, which will be a uh, tracking focus, with a medium um, uh, medium drive mode. And that's pretty much all I would change there. Now, now there was a question. Yes. Uh, do, 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 here, uh, which is, I dislike that the factory profile is the default. I'd like to see the factory settings as the reset function rather than cluttering the profile choices. This is a good, this is a good question. Yeah. Because let's say that I'm set up in my, you, there, there's a way around this. So I, I'm here, I'm in my handheld shooting mode. If I go back into user profiles and I say manage profiles, I should be able to. Oh, no, well, I, you can't go I to actually default. can't. No. The reason that default exists I actually is because can't. Leica wants to give you a way to reset the camera without having to reset the entire camera. Mm. So default is almost a reset without changing the time, the date, the file numbering, or your Wi Fi settings. Um, I agree, it's annoying. I, I, I would, actually double checked yeah. the manual uh, the, earlier today to make sure I wasn't missing because I knew this would come up. I feel like um, there used to be, I feel like on the SL601, you could overwrite the default profile. I don't remember, it's been a while. But no, so unfortunately you are stuck with that, which is that annoying. Is I think yeah. certainly feedback for Leica for the future, um, nobody's perfect, right? But for now, if you have your banker profile set up and you bounce between them, you know, it's not the end of the world. If you hit default by mistake, you just go back and pick your other profile versus resetting, which will actually wipe out your user profiles. Um, which, of course, if you're going to do that, you want to export your profiles to a memory card so you could re-import them later, which is one of the cool things about user profiles. So um, this camera actually is the one I use for a lot of my um, product photography, and I have some profiles I had made for that, which I just saved, and they're on my desk at work. So when I go back to the office uh, next week, I can just bring them back in, and the camera's just the way I left it. Yeah, and we can also do this, right? Which is, uh, if I take, let's say I showed you that I use this this function button here for drive mode. I could just as easily push this and assign it to user profiles. Yeah, the only challenge with this, as I mentioned earlier, is it re it's assigned to each user profile. You have to profile. assign it to user profiles 
inside of every user yes, profile. You do. Yes, you do. Or else it's you're gonna kid it, and it's sometimes gonna change your profile, and sometimes not. So, and that's something because I saw Lynn Lynn mentioned that I set up her user profiles. This is actually something that we had to be very careful about setting that button as user profiles in every user profile, because if you don't remember to change that right from the beginning then it's going to flip and it won't be uh, consistent. Right, which is why I just use the, the icon in the quick menu because it's always there and I don't have right. to worry about it. But it is nice to be able to use this mode, which is just by tapping it, I don't have to go in there. I can just right. That's true. wheel through these. That is true. Yeah. But you can also always get back here and, and go through there. So that is... Uh, wow, we actually covered what we... Pretty much wanted to cover. I am. Did we do it? Did I am that? blown away. Did we actually go through? The we didn't do the Q2, which we'll do uh, next time. The, the what now? Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. Then we're going to do M11 and M10 Monochrome. So it's a good resource. And we'll yeah, probably we'll, we'll we, rename it so yeah, you guys can find yeah. it. And then we'll, I don't know if we'll do all of them in a row. We'll probably space them out with some other stuff because we need to do a 28 episode soon. Um, but yeah, for sure, we'll make this a continuing series because we. And I'll, we'll both be looking for feedback in the comments on this show so we can continue to adjust our approach for these kind of menu episodes uh, going forward. Yeah. How do you guys like the format? Yeah. Uh, and, and yes, I, I do apologize. I really sped through at like my normal in the field pace. But keep in mind, I've been using the SL for the last seven, SL system for seven years. And it's also similar to the S, which goes back even more. And yeah. so we've both been using this kind of menu structure and setting custom functions and, and user profiles for a really long time. And I also have to be really fast because if I'm sitting on a bus with a group of people <laughs> on our way to a waterfall and everyone wants their camera set up, I've got to be like really, really fast because I'm not smart enough to export them to a memory card and then just load those profiles yeah. in everyone's camera. Yeah, which you could do. But in the end, um, this is a recorded video that you can watch you can slow and rewatch and slow down and pause anytime you want. So this will always live as a resource on our page that you can refer back to. And of course, you can also reach out to us if you have questions. Jose, any of us, Adam, Lorena in the store, whoever, whoever's around, Gabriel, uh, we can all help you because the reality is the SL2 sys and the SL2S is kind of the bread and butter of us. I think the takeaway though, and I, I see that there's some comments that the SL2 is complicated. Not really. It's actually one of the things that I love about the camera is how simple it can be and how customizable it also can be simultaneously. Mm. If you want to just pick this camera up and use it in its simplest form, you can. If you want to dive deep and set all those user profiles up and really customize the displays and the functionality, you have that choice too but don't feel that you have to, to use the camera. Yeah, You could just pick this up and start shooting. Are some of the default settings unfortunate as far as we're concerned? Yeah. Yes. Are they going to hamper your photography? Probably not. Uh, we think that getting the most out of the camera that you should make at least the recommended changes we went over for the very first part of the show, go through your menus, set those things up and then Make sure to save them just as, say, user profile one, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And then if you want to dive in, you saw that there's a lot of user profile banks available. Six. Six is a lot to customize. I generally only use two, maybe three at the most. Um, I've never used six user profiles. Have you? Uh, no. I think you would, if you were getting into six profiles, you're probably talking about very, very minute changes. Yeah between the profiles. Yeah. I could see if you're doing like really complicated like product photography mm -hmm. and different lighting setups mm -hmm. or uh, if you're doing like, I don't even know. It would be challenging, but I'm sure there's someone out there that uses There's probably someone out there who wishes there was more. They wish there was 20. Well, because I think I think when the camera came out, it has four. So clearly like it added two more. So somebody somewhere needed those extra two user profiles. Yeah, yeah, so fair enough. but. Hopefully, watching this video gave you at least a pretty good idea of what the SL system and what the SL2 and the SL2S are capable of in terms of the stills portion. I realized we didn't cover video. I realized we didn't cover everything. That wasn't the point. Um, there is an instruction manual on this website if you want. And of course, again, you have 
Well, us. okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Yes. There, there you go. So actually, having user profile for photo modes, like I just showed you, and then having user profile for video modes mm. could be useful if that's if that's your bag. Yeah, we'll do our video episode one day, in 2020. Uh, and then, um, you'll learn a lot about it. It's gonna be great. But uh, you know, again, you know, this is a very capable, customizable camera that can be utilized in very different ways without really having to go crazy in order to get the photos you want in an efficient way so you can sure. focus on shooting as opposed to focusing on tinkering and changing settings all the time. And in please update your TV. firmware. Please, please, please update your firmware. Because a lot of the stuff we showed you doesn't exist in the in three firmwares ago. Uh, yeah. And there's, there's reasons. Like a invest quite a lot of time and effort and resources into continual improvement of their cameras long after introduction. I mean, the, the SL601 that was introduced in 2015 continues to receive firmware updates. Yeah. Like, well, it's been a bit, but yeah. Somebody said, I said, the M3 is not complicated. Okay. <laughs> Load your film incorrectly. Try loading your film in the dark. Try to explain to someone who's ever used a rangefinder how frame lines work and the focus pan. It's complicated in a different way. To it, you know, to the un there's no light to the uninitiated, and there's no light meter, and there's no meter. So good luck getting exposure unless you have 20 years of practice. So, I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but the reality is, a tool is only as complicated as you make it, mm. and the utilization and understanding of that tool, the more so you have, the better results you're going to get, and the more confident you're going to be with it. And that's sure. we don't expect anyone, including ourselves, to simply go it alone. We work as a team and we experiment and we try and we try to share that knowledge so that you can figure this stuff out. That's the whole point of why we're sitting here, the three of us right now, For sure. in this tiny, sweaty room. <laughs> All right, I think you, um, I think we did it. Okay. You want to sign us off? Yes, I do. <laughs> a lot of, I do. A lot, I, a lot of I, mental energy. I used. feel. I feel drained. You did a good job, David. You really did some, some really good explanations that I think will serve as excellent reference points. You as well. Congratulations, yeah. Josh. I have my moments. You know. Yeah, yeah. We're, let's just agree that we're all great. Let's just. We're amazing. Yeah, the three of us. You are amazing. Can't stop us. You are amazing. All you. <laughs> all you out there are amazing. Yeah, it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for That's you. That's right. For you, everyone. So. Uh, all right. I think we uh, we did it. We covered everything we wanted to cover at least on the on the SL two SL two S. We will be coming back and you subscribe to Red Dot Forum YouTube channel. Uh, we continue to grow because of great viewers like you. And we're going to keep putting out content that you want to see. So make sure to subscribe, click the notification bell so you know when we go live, post new content, et cetera. Uh, also check out red.forum.com for the latest like news, reviews, details on firmware updates, all that stuff. You want to stay on, on top of that. You can also find Red Dot Forum on Apple News. You can subscribe to it there. And, and the archive section. Right. So on likeastormiami.com, under photography, if you go to past product archive and dig around, it might just be kind of, let me say, it was fun for me as I'm fleshing that out because I'm like, oh, wow, I totally forgot about that cool little camera. Mm -hmm. I Man, you remember that? You remember that? Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting cameras and lenses that you may have forgotten about that aren't super, you know, crazy limited editions. They were just limited runs yeah. of different finishes and different whatever. Um, so really cool there. Check it out. And we will be continuing to augment that resource with more information in terms of release dates and production runs and all that. So make sure to check that out. And also, if you want to... Uh, learn in the field and do and are interested in astrophotography and want to photograph in the scenic southwest. We have one spot remaining for our Moab astrophotography workshop. You can find information about that on likeastormiami.com under the workshops and event page. And Anna. before I forget to mention, um, I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but there is the Leica family and friends promo oh, yeah. going on from now till October 31st. $650 off of an SL2, SL2S body or bundle, $500 off and any of the Apple SL or the 15.4, any SL Prime lens. Mm -hmm. um, if you have questions about that, like Sir Miami, we're obviously participating in that promotion. We've done a bunch already. 
Um, great chance to save some serious money on a new SL body. If you have a 601, if you get about upgrading to an SL2 or grabbing a couple of primes, um, you get some good discounts. So. Or throwing an SL2S in the mix if you have an SL2. Yes, I, I had to make sure I mentioned that because I don't think... Yeah, yeah, I don't think you... And there's a story about that I read up for him. Yeah. Um, we'll mention it again on our next show when we... I don't more. think we actually mentioned that. No, I don't in think In the so. last few episodes. Well, so, now you know. Now you know. So uh, big thanks to Josh, Jose, and you guys for watching. Um, hey, there's Jose. Hey. There hey. he is. Hey. <laughs> He's been very busy keeping track of like who's talking about what menu at what time. So big thanks to Jose. This was uh, probably not one of the easiest episodes to produce. So everyone give it up to Jose. Yeah. Hey. Um, and thanks to you guys for watching. We will be back when? September something. I think the 10th is the only like Saturday that's something like open. that. So some, well, if you're subscribed, you'll know. And also if you just, I don't know. What else Keep track of us. Keep track. It's you know it's a it's a bit of a chaotic uh, bananas mess, but we're doing. We'll our best. be back. We will be back. That you can count on. And with another exciting episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk, uh, thank you. Good night. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, and we will see you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys.